Good evening, everyone. We are glad that you have joined us here for this panel discussion this afternoon. Uh, I'm hoping that you're hearing me loud and clear out there in the virtual space that we're in. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Central States Conference uh, Camp Meet and Panel Discussion on Race and the Justice System in America. Uh, we're glad to have you. I'm inviting all of the panel participants to, to go ahead and uh, get their videos on. And we're going to go into gallery mode in a few so that people can see uh, everyone. Uh, we're going to ask them that they will keep their, their mics muted, but put their videos on at this time. Uh, we're living in a time where uh, we as a church sometimes struggle with uh, what should we do? What, what, what can we do? Uh, how should we react uh, when we see things going on around our nation uh, that trouble us? Uh, and hopefully it does trouble us. Um, and uh, I want to start with a scripture, uh, Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 17. So if you have your Bibles, um, you can feel free to pull it up at this time. Isaiah 117 says, learn to do good, reading from the New Living Translation, learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of orphans, fight for the rights of widows. And that's just for the folk that kind of wonder, uh, why are we even having this discussion? I thought we were supposed to stay out, you know, of, of anything that deals with justice and just let the, uh, the government, let the law uh, handle it, but, but God has implored us uh, that we ought, uh, as Isaiah says, we ought to seek justice and help the oppressed, defend the cause of the orphans, and fight for the rights of widows. But before we get into this discussion this afternoon, again, thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to have a we're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, hopefully, you are seeing us. I'm I'm I'm. I'm looking at some internal possibilities that we may not be live. I want to I want to make sure that we are. I'm 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 want to make sure that we are. I want to make sure that we are. Okay. So, I'm not hearing that we're not, so I'll just keep on Okay. Okay, well maybe well maybe we need to you're live. Okay, well maybe we need to go ahead and pray. All right, well we're gonna go ahead and pray. Somebody says I'm live. So maybe the Facebook is doing something else than the YouTube. All right, so Pastor Bobby Waters, we need prayer today because because they are they're already trying to mess with us. Uh, <laughs> so Pastor Bobby Waters is the pastor uh, of the Bethesda Seventh day Adventist Church in Omaha. Nebraska. He's also the assistant to the president uh, for the Great Plains area. Uh, Pastor Waters, go ahead and say a word of prayer for us as we get started. Thank you. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the opportunity of just coming together. Lord, as we come to this sensitive issue, we simply ask that you'll open up our understanding. And Lord, we ask that as we reason together, that you will be in the midst. We pray, dear Lord, as we speak power to truth, that you will speak to our hearts and that you will give us directions, guidance. And Father, wherever we may be, whether we be pastor, whether we be district attorney or defendant attorney, or even the police, we simply ask, guide us all through this process because we know this world is not our home. And so Father, help us to live as godly to you because Lord, we know that truly we are the salt of the earth. Now bless this panel, bless our discussion. All that is said may be given honor to your name. This we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna have everybody wave when I call their name so that those of you who are watching online uh, can, see, can see who they are. They'll talk in a little bit, uh, but I just want you to know who they are. Uh, Dr. Tim Golden, is joining us. Uh, there he is from Washington uh, State Walla Walla University, uh, former attorney of 20 years. Um, and he's also a professor 
uh, out that way, Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor Ty Douglas is joining us. Just wave at the at everybody, Ty. Doctor Ty is professor at Columbia. Uh, I'm sorry, University of Missouri in Columbia, the Tigers. Uh, then we have Pastor Bobby Waters. Just wave, Pastor Waters, who just prayed uh, for us. We have Pastor Kimberly Bulgin, uh, one of our pastors here at the New Beginning Seventh Day Adventist Church in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, we've got Pastor Jonathan Fields, who is right now on the front lines. Uh, and, and, and uh, okay, yep. Uh, and then we have uh, Pastor Marcus Laravo. Uh, there he is from the Allen Chapel Seventh Day Adventist Church. Pastor Fields is from the Ebenezer Fellowship, New Life Church is up in Minneapolis. Literally, he's on the ground uh, doing some stuff right now. Uh, marching in the streets. Uh, we've got my good friend, Claudia Allen. Uh, just going to wave, Claudia. Uh, I, I want to call her a social activist, uh, but but that wouldn't even do her enough justice. But she is uh, completing her PhD, and she specializes as well in dealing with history, uh, and, and, and in particular, uh, African-American history um, and English uh, and the like. Uh, we have Officer Uric Hunt. Uric, just wave your hand right where you are. Uh, he's, he's right here in Kansas City. He's a member of the Linwood Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, we've got Judge, uh, Your Honor, Kevin Harrell. Uh, he's not Your Honor on the weekend, he said, uh, but we always want to give him that respect. Uh, Kevin, glad to have you, man. Uh, he works right here in the Kansas City area. Um, always, also was a former prosecutor, man, and we're proud of the work uh, that he's done here. We've got Dr. Courtney Ray, uh, who, Courtney just waved, all right. Uh, there she is. She is a, a mental health expert. She's got her doctorate uh, in, in something with neuroscience, but I'm going to let her share. Uh, everybody's going to share what they actually do because uh, I don't want to mess up anybody's uh, work time, uh, but she is a professional uh, out there in New York. Uh, and then we've got Officer Robert O'Kelly, uh, one of our members uh, and and from the Northside Seventh-day Adventist Church. So at this time, at this time, uh, we're gonna have them uh, kind of unmute themselves and they're gonna share with us. Tell us, uh, panelists, in a baby uh, a minute or two, uh, tell us who you are uh, as far as what you actually do for a living. Uh, and then tell us also how the, the tragic death of yet another African-American male. And when I wrote this, it was only uh, at the time, uh, not long after George Floyd, but we've had several uh, after that. But tell us how these things affect you all uh, as, as law enforcement, uh, as, as people, whether professionally or, or individually, as, as African-American men and women. Uh, just go ahead, go ahead and tell us who you are, and, and how, how the deaths of George Floyd uh, and others have impacted you personally or professionally. We'll start with, we'll start with Judge, Judge, Judge Kevin Harrell. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, again, my name is Kevin Harrell. I'm a judge here in uh, Missouri, 16th Circuit. Uh, I was a prosecutor for about 17 years. I've been on the bench now for about eight years. Um, Personally, uh, I'm sure all of us have felt the same way. I, I mean, I was just hurt and devastated uh, with the recent events. And I say that because I'm one that I don't really uh, let a lot of world events really affect me. I mean, I am of the world and I know about them, but they don't really personally affect me. But these recent events here lately have really bothered me so much so to the point that a couple of days uh, last week, I literally cried the closer I got to the building. I literally cried the closer I got to going into the courthouse thinking about we can't just continue to do, I can't rather continue to do business uh, as usual if I had done before. And I'm not saying I had, but if I had, it can't be business as usual. And so um, it just made me reassess and, and reevaluate uh, for, it's, it's making me, I should say, reassess and reevaluate professionally. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate that. Uh, Pastor Bolgen, uh, Kim, uh, tell us a little bit about what you've done down there 
Um, and, and how has it affected you? Tell us, tell them a little bit about who you are and, and how it's affected you. Well, I'm the pastor of the New Beginnings SDA Church in Wichita, Kansas. Um, it's been a blessing to serve the community there thus far. And um, I, frankly, I have not watched the George Floyd video um, and I don't plan on it. Just the picture alone was traumatic in and of itself. Um, I think this is probably the, the first in a while where um, I cried like the judge was talking about um, just seeing the image alone. Um, and it's, it's been a wave of emotions ever since between sadness, exhaustion, um, anger, all of it uh, wrapped up in one. So it's definitely been um, a taxing, emotionally taxing. I guess I'm a bit of an empath. So that's another reason why I was like, I, I can't watch. Um, so I, you know, feeling, feeling, feelings is, is, is a real thing for me. So um, it's been, it's been intense these last few weeks. Uh, plus the most recent uh, man, Rayshard, who got shot is again. So it's been a surreal few weeks dealing with all of this uh, tragedy around us for sure. And then still having to do life do ministry um, on top of that has definitely been been a challenge. Mercy, mercy, mercy. I hear you. Uh, Dr. Tim, Dr. Tim Golden, tell us about yourself, man, and how this thing has impacted you. Yes, uh, Pastor. I, I'm a, I'm professor of philosophy at Walla Walla University in College Place, Washington. I just completed my fifth year here at Walla Walla University. Um, Behind me is a picture of Charles Hamilton Houston. And for those of you who may not know who he, who he is, he, him and Thurgood Marshall essentially took down Jim Crow in the United States through a variety of legal, very strategic legal challenges. And it left us after the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 with a profound sense of optimism and hope for the future. And as I watched George Floyd suffocate beneath the knee of Officer Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis, I couldn't help but think that the past 50 plus years have lulled America into a false sense of security, believing that there has been legitimate progress in the area of race relations. And from, for me, <clears throat> it wasn't just watching George Floyd die, but it was watching the privilege of white womanhood in Amy Cooper in Central Park in New York City, who exploit black death by putting the police at their beck and call and very intentionally saying to Christian Cooper that I'm going to call the police and tell them that an African American man is threatening me. When she made that call, she knew what she was doing. And she wanted the police to do to Christian Cooper what they did to George Floyd and what they did to Breonna Taylor and Sandra Bland and Rakia Boyd and go down the list. And, and so my fear, uh, it makes me fearful that we live in a world where even now the optimism of the protests and many people are remarking that there are younger generations of whites who are joining hands with black folks and protesting around the world. Um, my worst <clears throat> fear right now is that the optimism of the present moment will have a narcotic effect similar to that which we've endured the past 50 years. And that we may be left to think that just because everyone is protesting now that things will somehow change in the long run. Uh, I'm not terribly optimistic about that. That's not to say that we shouldn't protest. That's not to say that we shouldn't seek legal reform. But I guess when I put together how I'm feeling about everything, I feel afraid um, and my, my, I'm more afraid of how we respond in this moment than I am about the terrifying nature of the moment itself. And as we talk more, I guess I can elaborate on that. But 
that's sure. that's how I'm feeling right about now. That's a, that's that's well, that's a lot. That's you you felt a lot there, uh, man. Uh, Pastor Waters, uh, as go ahead, tell us who you are and and how this thing has affected you, man. All right, I'm Pastor Bobby Waters. I'm pastor of the Bethesda Temple Seventh Day Adventist Church. I've been in pastorate for 38 years, and uh, interesting because I come from a military uh, family, and that is, you know, we ran things by the regiment, and my father taught us. He said, there's seven words you need to know, and your life depends on it. That was yes, sir, no, sir, thank you, sir, and that was dealing with, should I saw, uh, say, law enforcement, so those are pretty easy there, but I can say seeing as far as uh, Floyd's death really has affected me physically. I was in doing my physical and I found myself taking deep breath, didn't even realize until my doctor, she's a woman, she just waited for a moment. I'm just sitting up there because that image of him trying to breathe really affected me. I was really sucking in and she said, well, I didn't ask you, she said, I'm not at your lungs yet. And, um, and then she just asked, she said, what's going on? And then I told her. And so she just kind of waited until I composed because that right there, seeing that, I mean, it, like I said, I even find myself still trying to take deep breath for him. So it has physically messed with me. And just to see that, okay, take it off. Just that's all you have to do is just take it off and the refusal of not doing that. So callous has made me almost, because also I've got millennial children who, who are out there on the front line. They push me out there as well. Black Lives Matter. They got signs posted up in the yard and everything. And of course my fear is, I'm hoping, I'm just hoping that there will be a change to satisfy, but I know it's a long struggle and seen it before, seen this movie before, and hopefully somehow or another the end changes on this one there, so. Mm, mm. Mercy, mercy, mercy. I'm gonna go to one of our sisters, uh, Claudia. Tell us who you are and, and how this thing has impacted you personally, professionally. Hello everyone, uh, I am Claudia Allen. Uh, currently I'm the online content manager for Message Magazine. Um, as Pastor Kristan said, I um, was pursuing my PhD in English literature and, and, um, and so I've taught on critical race theory and, and many of these issues. And um, as Judge Harrell uh, even mentioned, I have found myself uh, really feeling pushed and prodded um, to even leave the Literary Academy to um, seek uh, full-time employment in public service um, just because of uh, a genuine passion um, for these issues and these, these topics. Um, and so I write and speak on this stuff a lot all the time. This is maybe what panel 50. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mercy. I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. I think um, the George Floyd case in particular, um, as everyone Kim has said was a very emotional one. Uh, I did not watch that video on purpose. Um, and I think even uh, hearing about, I don't know if you guys heard of uh, Robert Fuller out there in Palmdale, California, who uh, was um, hung and law enforcement determined it a suicide. When you hear things like this, just consistently back to back all of the time, um, it really does put an emotional burden on you as well as an intellectual one um, that really just causes you to feel like you don't get a break. And as I was talking to a friend of mine, I realized that for the last four or five weeks, I hadn't been breathing uh, because he didn't. And so because they took his <clears throat> breath, I'm gonna go and write and speak and do everything all the time, nonstop, three panels a day. It's all good. And I had not caught a breath. And wow. so um, just the reality of, um, in one way or another, we are a people that are, are constantly trying to, to catch our breath. So. Mercy, mercy, wow. 
That's a lot. Breathe, a lot of your breathe. Right. <laughs> breathe. Thank you for being with us, man. Uh, I'm going to go to one of our officers, Officer Yurik. I know he's busy, but I'm glad uh, Officer Yurik Hunt is on the line with us. Yurik, man, t- tell us a little bit about you, man, and, and how you coping being an officer and a Black man in America. Got you, got you. Hey, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hey, as it's been said, I'm uh, Yurik, last name Hunt. I am a sergeant with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. I'm also a member of our uh, armed forces, our military, um, where I am a platoon sergeant, where I uh, oversee 3540 of our uh, American soldiers. So for me, uh, as everyone's already been said, this has significantly impacted me uh, just uniquely because I have the ability, I live, I live in both worlds. I am a black man and I am a black police officer. So as you can imagine, it is just significantly emotionally and physically draining. Um, it's been said, you just feel like you haven't been able to take a breath. I, I definitely wholeheartedly understand that feeling as well. Um, it never fails that it just depends on the audience that I'm in front of as to the position that I have to kind of take. And what I mean by that, when I'm on a panel discussion like this, and obviously it feels like I'm put in a position where I need to speak or defend for police officers, or when I'm in front of police officers, then I feel like I need to speak and defend the African-American culture. For me, what I make very clear, I cannot speak for every black male. I cannot speak for every police officer. I can only speak for me. Um, And like uh, the judge Errol has said that this incident has been probably one of the most egregious ones to me since, or definitely gave me the same feeling as the whole Rodney King uh, incident situation. So uh, for me, it's definitely just tiring, overwhelming emotionally and physically, but I understand the position I am in and I accept that and take that on wholeheartedly and feel like that I have been put in a position I've been put in for a reason and, and I don't don't back away from that at all. So I feel like I can do the most good in my position. And I think, you know, as it's been said, we all are just are called to do our part. So for me, I'm just doing my part. Wow, wow. Well, you know, before this panel, before we, we end, I'm talking to the end before I get to the middle, uh, we're definitely going to say a word of prayer for you, Yuri, uh, and all of our officers who are in that in in that pinch. Um, Dr. Courtney, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and how this thing has impacted you, even as a mental health professional. All right. So my name is Courtney Ray, and I am an ordained pastor, and I've pastored for about almost twenty years. And um, I also have my PhD in clinical neuropsychology. So right now I'm in New York, New Jersey, and I have my own private practice. And I also teach at the City University of New York. And one and lots of people don't know what a neuropsychologist is. Um, just like there are different physicians that have different specialties, like you know, a cardiologist is the person who deals with your heart or that you go to a nephrologist if you need something with your kidneys. Um, Similarly, for psychology, um, there are different specialties as well. And so neuropsychologists particularly look at how the brain and the biology of the brain has an effect on behavior and mood and emotions and how your physiological uh, health and your mental health kind of combine. And so we do a lot of stuff with ADHD and autism and, um, and, you know, Alzheimer's, lots of different things. And one of my research areas is trauma and how trauma affects your mental state as well as your physiological state. And as I'm listening to everybody talk about how they've been feeling, you know, all of those things are definitely normal. Um, when people say like, I, had shortness of breath or my stomach was hurting or my head was hurting or, you know, all of these Mm. physiological manifestations of this stressful event, that's totally normal for um, feeling um, what you should be feeling if you have been exposed to a traumatic event. And trauma isn't just about a one-time thing, it's chronic stress over and over again. And it doesn't have to happen to you directly but it can be vicarious, which means just seeing something happen to someone else and you being able to empathize with that creates that same reaction in you as it would if you were there in the moment. 
And so a lot of what I've been doing, because I kind of know about that and I recognize that um, and I can kind of understand that, like I've been trying to take care of my own mental health and my own um, de-stressing because of the traumatic incident that we all witnessed. Um, even if you d weren't watching the video, you were still exposed to that. And racism is in the background all the time. And so that constant exposure is something that has had an effect on all of us um, and particularly you know, our community. So a lot of what I've been doing is just trying to make sure that I take care of myself, put on your mask first, right? Um, but also right. trying to help other people who are in my community, in my sphere of influence, in churches, in my patients, my students, just kind of understand how this has been a, an impact on them because we just had COVID and it still hasn't finished. Like sometimes people forget that we're still in the middle yeah. of a pandemic. So yeah, we absolutely. have that on top of this and on top of all the background racism that's already always going on. And so just really helping people um, kind of understand what's going on to deal with it. Like Claudia said, I've been on like 50 panels doing, doing things like this um, and then Zoom calls and conference calls and things with corporate um, people and things with different organizations and with churches trying to just help people to really reconcile all these feelings of being overwhelmed with what's going on. And, you know, at a point, it just, it, it is overwhelming because even though you know intellectually what's going on, still mm -hmm. the effects of that just constantly, like this is, even after George Floyd's murder, we still have so many people who have still been affected. And so seeing all this, wow. it, it's, wow. it's devastating and it's really impacting us. And I want to do as much as I can to help our communities really deal with it and, and grapple with it and heal from that. Wow, wow, thank you. You, you helped us already in what you shared. You've helped us already. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go to Dr. Ty. Uh, well, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Ty. Uh, I know you were on Fox News the other day, uh, but tell us about you, man, and, uh, and how this thing has impacted you. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation, Pastor Josiah. Um, uh, pleasure to be on. Uh, for me, you know, I, um, I'm a professor at the University of Missouri uh, in the Education, Leadership, and Policy Analysis Department. Um, uh, I've been here since 2012. I also serve as a lay pastor um, of a church plant here in Columbia, Missouri. So we're in the Central States territory, though our, our affiliation has been with the Iowa Missouri Conference, which I share that for context as relates to my journey. Um, you know, uh, Michael Brown died on August 9th, uh, 2014. Um, and so I feel like the rest of the world has sort of been trying to catch up with where we've been, you know, for the last five, six, seven years, you know. So for me, George Floyd's uh, death, uh, killing, uh, uh, murder was effectively sort of a bookend uh, mm -hmm. sort of experience for me personally, having been in this state of Missouri uh, when Michael Brown's life was cut short and, and being actively involved, you know, prior to that in these conversations, uh, and then obviously actively involved you know, in the streets and the community uh, from Michael Brown's death to now. So um, there, there is certainly, um, uh, and it, for me, there's an intensity, there's a, there's a focus for me that sort of come from um, being engaged in this work, um, you know, for a number of years, but there's also a fatigue that we have to navigate as well. Uh, so I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in between those spaces, but, but, but energized by the moment. I feel like there has been something different. Like, I feel like, you know, as folks say, like this one hit different, like this George Floyd one hit a little bit different. And I think it has to do with the pandemic. I think it has to do with the fact that we've, you know, folks have been, you know, you know uh, enclosed for three, four months, um, you know, no basketball, you know, you're not just cheering for the white folks because they play for your team. Like there's just a different focus. And I mean, I, I was watching soccer yesterday and they had like when the back guys jerseys, like uh, black lives matter. Like, so I, I, wow. there's something has shifted. There's a shift that took place. And so I'm actually hopeful for multiple reasons. One, um, you know, when we talk about uh, our, our church and we talk about Nebuchadnezzar statue and the, and the world of the United States, and we talk about uh, the kingdoms that will, you know, be dismantled and the like, I think we fail to consider what that means, like as relates to the, the, 
the, the ethos of this country, right? It's more than just yeah. nationalism. Like the United States was birthed in white supremacy. And so what you're seeing mm -hmm. is the dismantling of that. So I'm actually excited um, because I see the, I, I believe the revolution is actually being televised in front of us. And I'm hopeful that many of our white brothers and sisters that I've had the opportunity to work with through my connections to the church um, will continue to, to, to or, or, or even more actively join us in this fight. So I remain hopeful, Pastor Josiah, as you know, um, in 2014, you came down for the first back to school explosion, right? You remember that? You guys came yep, down, yep, you supported us. Um, yeah, this year will be our seventh, right? This will be our seventh. It's like the perfect number. Right? Wow. Uh, and, and so there was, I've seen some seminal moments, like my research is around black families, black identity, um, but I've also done work in athletics. So I was literally working with our black male student athletes at Mizzou in 2015, 2014, 2015, doing some work mm -hmm. for the NCAA. So I've seen up close and personal when white folks who have learned a bit about the history of this country and the realities of systematic oppression, they begin to see this thing, some of them a little differently. And I've seen hope in their eyes when they say, man, like racism is, is the enemy on the other side of the proverbial football. So I'm hopeful that my Christian brothers and sisters uh, will join us even more actively in this fight. Um, and I'm you know, engaged uh, obviously in, in ministry here and intentional right. also though, about thinking about what does it look like to build systems that heal. I like to say systems of healing, right? And mm. so I think we need to really be thoughtful about what our institutions uh, are doing and can look like to ensure there are safe, healthy spaces yes. for our black boys and girls in particular as we navigate these structures around us. Wow, wow, man, I appreciate that, brother. So uh, before, thank you, Ty. Before we get to Officer Kelly and Pastor Laravo, I wanna go to Pastor Jonathan Fields, who is live on the streets of Minneapolis, Minnesota. So he's going to drop off soon. Uh, uh, Pastor Fields, tell us what's going on yes, down there, man. Tell us what's yes, going sir. on. We're here. We're here. We're here on Ground Zero. Uh, my name is Pastor Jonathan B. Fields, Jr. I'm the pastor of Ebenezer Fellowship um, here off of Lake Street, just about two and a half blocks down from where um, District 3 um, was set ablaze. Um, several wow. of the businesses down the street from our church um, were set ablaze. Um, blaze, thank God, our church wasn't affected. Um, yeah. As I came through and rolled through the community a few weeks ago when it all started, there were two things that I noticed when you asked the question, "What? how has it affected me? Um, there are two things that um, struck me. In one area, I saw how the community came out and how the community was pulling together to paint, um, picking up, cleaning up. Um, trying to get the area back together again that was destroyed uh, by the um, looting and the bombing and, the, um, and, and all the tear gas. And then you go down just a few more blocks on 38th and 8th, um, and 38th and Chicago, where George Floyd's life was taken. There you saw another scene of um, Black Lives Matter, um, a rally, no justice, no peace. So on one end, you had the community coming together um, to take care of what was destroyed. On the other end, you had a community coming together to try to seek justice for the injustice that has been going on for so long. Um, we were out today, um, early this morning. We started the morning out with our young people. Um, I had them on earlier. They're standing behind me, if you can see. Um, they're behind me. Um, we fed. Um, and so we don't want to be so far left where we can't see right. And so we were out taking care of the community feeding, passing our food, because keep in mind, the Target, the um, Aldi's, and all those businesses that was destroyed as a result of the looting and the bombing, this was how, this, that was how this community ate. Uh, it fed a lot of families, it fed a lot of babies, it fed a lot of individuals, individuals who don't have cars, who don't have the ability to get to this, who used to walk to those stores, who now have to find some other means to get to um, the, the stores. And so we were out feeding, we were out um, taking care of our community. And on the second half, we came over here, we did a march to show our support as Seventh Day Adventists that we believe that lives, that black lives do matter. I know the question said, well, all lives matter. Well, I heard so many different stories about a house on the street. If one house was on the fire, a fire truck come down the street, he's not gonna stop at just any house. He's gonna stop at the house that's on fire. And so while yeah, all lives do matter, um, the struggle is a bit, it has been against black folk for some time now. So we're just out here on ground zero, um, showing our support, praying. We actually have a service, we prayed, we gave a word, and we're just letting the community know that we are here to support, not just in 
just taking pictures of the murals as you can see there are a lot of mm. people around here but we're here to show them christ that's why we're here to lift amen. them up and to show them christ all right amen man we appreciate you man uh you can mute yourself jonathan but if you want to stay on on this line feel free to stay on man and we might come back to you before we get done uh want to go all the way to um lincoln nebraska uh to Pastor Marcus Laravo, uh, who had a chance to speak for the Nebraska State Senators uh, a few a few weeks ago. Marcus, how are you doing, man? How this thing impacted you um, professionally and, and personally? Um, thank you, thank you so much for inviting me to be here and to be a part. And um, good afternoon to all of us that are watching here today, and to all of our panel presenters. Uh, I want to, uh, if you would if you don't mind, as humbly as I can, broaden the question. Um, sure. uh, we were asked about how we're doing personally and profess professionally about another death of an African-American man. Um, and I think that the semantics of it perhaps is important that we say that it is not just African-American men that are dying, that it's also African-American women that are dying um, and that are dying at alarming rates and their Black Lives Matter as well. And we want to be sure to include the full panoply of that Black lives and whatever forms that they come, that all of their lives matter. And so, uh, and so we've seen George Floyd, we've also seen Breonna Taylor and, and we, we've talked about uh, Mike Brown and we've also talked about Sandra Bland. And the, um, it's important that we include all these voices in the conversation. Yes. Uh, in terms of how it's impacted me, I won't talk about professionally because I think that, you know, we're all professionals here on the line. We've all been involved in activism in some sense. And all of us are doing our part. And in some sense, all of us are tired and are fighting against justice fatigue. Um, but I do want to talk about how I'm doing personally, and I'm glad to hear some of the answers of some of the panelists. Uh, my answer is that I am hopeful. And that answer I shared with some people, and they had it, it's been kind of a controversial response uh, because I, I am hopeful. And because I'm hopeful, I feel like I'm thrashed. Uh, I'm flourishing and thriving and prospering in spite of what I see around me. Uh, the truth is that this is not new to many of us. The work of justice didn't start uh, over the course of the past few weeks when we watched the video or when it became a national story. For, for many of us, we have dedicated time in our lives and our life calling and our ministries and our professions to fighting for black people and fighting for a more just society. Um, and so for, for me in a lot of ways, the only thing that has changed in the past few weeks is that they're talking about it on every major news channel. Um, and, um, and so uh, while I, I, I did watch the video of George Floyd um, and it did impact me personally. That wasn't the first time I saw an issue of injustice. And, um, and, and, and for me, uh, what I do see is opportunity here for us to be able to shake the room, for us to be able to make real change and uh, for us to take advantage of the opportunity to do so um, in this time as much as we are able. Uh, now, uh, I think it was Dr. Golden who talked earlier about optimism. And I think that optimism is different from hope. Um, I'm hopeful while I may not be optimistic. Uh, oh. uh, I'm not optimistic because um, to me, optimism is confidence that things will get better. And what, what I have seen is that the system has proven that it cannot rectify itself. And that is not encouraging. Um, so I'm not really optimistic, but I am hopeful, which is different to me, um, which it, hope to me is a passionate confidence that the same God who led us through our issues that we've seen in the past, the same God that led us through the issues before it became a national story, the same God that was with us through slavery, that was with us through Jim and Jane Crow, the same God that's been with us through mass incarceration, the same God that, that was with us when we marched for, Mark, for, for Mike Brown and when we marched 
march for Philando Castile, when we march for Sandra Bland, when we march, the same God that led us before will be with us in the future. Uh, uh, I say hope is faith on its tiptoes looking over the obstacles in your way. It's not that there are no obstacles and it's not that we have this optimism because what we see in front of us looks good. What, what I have is even though what is in front of us does not look good, even though it's challenging, even though we're tired, even though we've been fighting for years and years and years, because God is with us, we will be okay. Oh. And, that, um, and that is my posture. And because that is my posture, personally, how I'm doing, um, I can then say I'm flourishing. I, I can still say uh, I am prospering. I can still say I'm living my best life every day. Um, and, and that too is a protest. Um, last oh. thing, um, it's uh, James Baldwin has a quote and he says to be black and to be woke or to be relatively conscious is to almost constantly be in a state of rage. Uh, mm. To be black and conscious and aware of what's going on is, is to almost be in a constant state of rage. And wow. if that is true, which I think that many of us on the line and many of us watching will testify to, then to say in spite of what we see that we are hopeful that to say in spite of what we see, to decide that we will have joy, that we will celebrate on Juneteenth, that we will, um, that we will live our best lives in spite of it, that we will continue to fight even though the fight is tiring. To have joy in the midst of them is a form of protest. That's, oh. That is a form of defiance. Oh. It is a form of rebellion. And so, and so that is how I choose to operate in my oh as well to wow. how am I doing personally I am hopeful I have joy I am thriving I am prospering and God is with me so everything will be all right wow well we we, we take all of that joy and we take all of that hope as panelists uh and I pray that that went out uh into the airways and, and encouraged somebody man thank you for that mm -hmm. uh, Robert O'Kelly uh who is officer and sheriff and all that good stuff tell us Tell us about yourself, man. How how you doing doing this time? Hey, Pastor Josiah, thanks for the invitation. And as you stated, uh, well, let me state this: before the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department pinned a badge on my chest, I was born to two lovely parents that were both Seventh Day Adventists, and I was been a Seventh Day Adventist long before I wore that badge. And mm -hmm. To say whether or not it's because I'm a Christian or whether I was a trained police officer, it's difficult because nothing that I see in the news media or nothing that I saw out of 25 years on the streets of the city of St. Louis surprises me or surprised mm. me because as a police officer, and the sergeant can tell you this, you can't do that job and be shocked. You can't do that job and 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 not be able to perform in a manner that that situation has to be taken care of. And and when I saw that incident with Mr. Floyd, I know it's a police officer responsibility to look out for the safety and well-being of anybody that you have under your control. Mm -hmm. And as an Adventist, you all know Second Peter three nine says, "The Lord is not slack concerning His promise." as some mm -hmm. men count slackness, but as long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but mm -hmm. that all should come to repentance. And it was a responsibility when an individual is saying, I can't breathe, then you have to look after that need of that individual, regardless mm -hmm. of the crime that he did. If your life is not in danger, then he's under your care and control and you have to seek that attention that he desired. So once again, thank you for having me and I'm glad to be here. Wow, wow, wow. Well, listen, man, um, I, thank, I thank you all and I thank Dr. Ray uh, for sharing already why all of us are, have been traumatized uh, because we've seen this thing over 
and over and over again. And, and, and I hope you guys were listening to her as she shared uh, about, about taking breaths and uh, making sure you're taking, uh, taking care of your, your health. So I wanna go directly uh, to, to, to the judicial system. Um, is there a way for us to address and possibly change how the system might work for minorities? And I, the example that I gave uh, is, is uh, for those of you who are, uh, are in law enforcement, for those of you who are in the judicial system, uh, you know that that the, the prosecutors kind of rely on the police department, and they they work hand in hand, and the judge works with the district attorney. And, um, and when something wrong goes uh, or, or happens that's a little off, uh, how 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 can we help to to make it better? I, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start with the judge. How, how can what can we do? to help the system work where it's as fair and as equitable as, as, as possible. Right. Judge Harold, Pastor, jo Pastor Josiah, I don't mind you starting off with me, but I will ask you to circle back to me after sure. others weigh in, if, uh, if you would, please. Okay, no, no problem. So I'm gonna, um, I'm, oh, I'm go gonna try to be practical in my response. Yeah. Um, you know, we all have to participate in the system and that is the only way in my opinion that we're going to be able to bring about some real change and what i mean by that is you know we're all not going to be police officers we're not all going to be prosecutors defense attorneys um and things of that nature but some of us are uh and those of us who are willing to do it we have to do it it's it's not enough to say well someone has to um, we have to actually get in there and do it. But for those of us who, uh, that's not our bend, you can, we can start by just serving on juries. And I know that sounds silly, but we, and I'm painting with a very broad brush here, we as uh, people of color, I know we have an in inherent distrust of the system, but I have seen time and time again where we come to jury duty and we spend more time trying to get off of a jury than to participate in the jury. And then we get mad when we get results like we get, um, but we don't want to participate. So just practically speaking, we can just participate where we can, get in where we fit in until we have a bigger piece uh, of the puzzle. So, you know, we have to be a part of the system to affect change. That's, I'll start by wow. saying that. Yeah, man, that's, that, that's good. And I'm, I'm writing it down. You just convicted me the next time I get a jury duty. Uh, <laughs> boy, I, I, I hear you. I hear you, man. I hear you. Uh, Claudia, I'm gonna come back to Claudia. Thank you, Kevin. I might come back to you in a little bit. Uh, but Claudia, uh, based on the, uh, you've been in this, this, this um, social justice fight for a long time. Uh, what, what you heard a judge, what else, what else can we do? Um, is there a way to address and possibly change, help to change the system? What's your take? Sure. So, um, I actually had to have the privilege of, um, completing the first cohort in theology and racialized policing with, uh, Sojourners Howard University Divinity School and the uh, Christian Community Development Association. So uh, Dr. Trulier in one of our sessions, uh, he teaches at Howard, but also does a lot of work around prison reform. And he shared that one of the ways that churches and church leaders in particular can actually get involved in criminal justice reform, particularly around uh, mass incarceration, is you can actually go to court hearings. So he's found that um, if a young person, for example, um, is going to court and they go into that courtroom without family, without community, the courtroom is relatively empty, more than likely that young person is going to get a longer sentence than if the entire community comes into the courtroom, individuals have written the judge, 
parties involved. And so oh. one of the things that he recommends is that churches actually pay attention to these kinds of things and just go to public court hearings in attendance and just pack those things out and show that we as a church, we as a community actually care about this person from arrest all the way through to re-entry. Um, so I think mm. that's another uh, really cool kind of practical thing uh, that we can do as well. Wow, that's good. That's good. I got it. I'm taking notes. Uh, Dr. It, it helps Dr. to actually know them too, though. It helps to actually know the person. Okay. So, I, to know I, the defendant. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen I got you. Sometimes people want to come and testify for them, but they don't even know their name. Mercy. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. Hey, look. Hey, look. I got. I got a whole nother sermon on this. It also helps no, no, to know. The good, I'm just. I'm being facetious, but that's a good point. No. No. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and let me tell you, it's also good to know the judge. So if something happened to me in Kansas City, <laughs> oh man, oh man, I'm, I'm calling in, Kevin, I'm calling in. Uh, let me go to uh, Dr. Golden, uh, attorney, um, well, former attorney, uh, professor now. Uh, wh what do you see in the system uh, that, will, that, that, that can change and how, how, how could we make some change there? Well, I, I wanna echo the two things that have already been said, one, you, you have to stop avoiding jury duty. Uh, that has to come to an end. If you're not on the jury, then you, you can't get mad at the jury when they acquit the police officers in the Rayshard Brooks case. It's a bunch of black people in Atlanta right now who are out there protesting. And a couple of months from now or a year from now, they're gonna come home and they're gonna see a jury summons. And the first thing they're gonna wanna do is think about how they got to take off of work and they only about to get paid $8 a day and they mess yep. with my money and, all, right. this and all that. And then you're going to be mad when white folk on the jury come back uh, not guilty. So <laughs> that's important. And, um, and to Claudia's point, I mean, I, you know, I defended people in court in Philadelphia for, for 20 years, man. And when nobody is there for you at your sentencing, you're, you're just a number. But when you have people behind you, that, that goes a long way. So uh, I wanna echo those two things. Um, I, I also wanna say, make two more points. One is a practical suggestion and the other one is, is more theoretical. So uh, practically speaking, I think we make the mistake of placing too much emphasis on policing. I think policing matters but I think it really is called criminal justice reform for a reason, because criminal justice is a reference to the entire system. So it isn't just policing, it is a careful consideration of how charging decisions are made by prosecutors. It's examining the relationship between prosecutors and police that sometimes presents itself to the public at least as being such a cozy relationship that I get the feeling sometimes, especially in Ferguson, Missouri with Michael Brown about six years ago, I got the distinct impression that that prosecutor went into that grand jury room, put forth very little effort to put on any credible evidence, but because grand jury proceedings are secretive and the public isn't allowed, Nobody knows what happens. And then the, the DA comes out and gives a statement and says, the grand jury has failed to indict. Um, one of the things that I think has to happen as a practical matter is that in police abuse cases, we have to find a way, we have to find a way to eliminate grand jury investigations and subject police defendants to preliminary hearings or probable cause hearings. Why do I say that? Because a preliminary hearing is a public proceeding in which if you're a prosecutor, you actually have the burden of going forward with evidence in front of a judge where everyone is allowed. It's arguably even better for the defendants because the defendant gets to be there with their lawyers and confront and cross-examine witnesses and most importantly, the proceeding is transparent so mm. that everybody can see what's happening. One of the 
things that really bothers black people, I think, is that these police officers do things and, and there's zero accountability and we don't even really know what happened. And so the real problem with our criminal justice system, I think, is the lack of transparency and accountability because there's a large segment of our population in African-Americans who has zero confidence in the system. And how do you build that confidence? You build that confidence through transparency and accountability and grand jury investigations simply don't provide that. So we have to find a way to uh, allow for police officers who, for example, in the Michael Brown situation, there were no less than three eyewitnesses who testified that Officer Darren Wilson shot Michael Brown while he had his hands up. Now, if Jamal shoots Ray Ray and there's three eyewitnesses who testify that he shot Ray Ray when Ray Ray had his hands up, there's not going to be a grand jury investigation. You know what's going to happen? He's going to get arrested. He's going to be held without bail. And he's going to be told that he's going to have to go to court. And those witnesses are going to come to court and they're going to testify at a preliminary hearing. And the judge is going to view the evidence in the light most favorable to the state and assume that what these witnesses have said is true. And if what they've said is true, does it amount to a crime? It does, they're held for trial. That's the way it works for everybody else. And people see two standards at work and that's troublesome. So I think we have to, as a practical matter, we have to find a way to eliminate um, grand jury investigations. And this is, I think, a local matter that district attorneys, people who are, if you wanna uh, get involved and get involved in the system, Find out who is running for district attorney in your locality. Go to the forums, press them with questions. How do you? How are you going to make charging decisions in police abuse cases? Are you going to commit to the secrecy of grand jury proceedings over preliminary hearings? If you are, you don't deserve my vote. These are things that we have to start doing at a practical level to ensure a greater level of transparency and accountability so that the perception of the system is not undermined, but rather bolstered. So yeah. that's one thing. Hey, hey, Tim, Tim, yes. grand juries are made up of the citizens as well, though. Grand juries are made up of the citizens, but prosecutors are not held as accountable as they are in preliminary hearings because no one is allowed in the room but the prosecutor. A prosecutor yeah. could does not have to even make a good faith effort with a grand jury, a prosecutor could stand on his head, pick his nose and come out of the grand jury room and say, sorry, we don't have an indictment, right? Whereas if there's a preliminary hearing, it's a public hearing, media is allowed at that hearing and the prosecutor who's duty bound to make a good faith effort in criminal prosecutions, right? And I'm not suggesting that every prosecutor does this. I'm not suggesting that every prosecutor uh, fails to make a good faith effort, but in terms of public perception, which is critical for mm. public confidence in the system, you have to put the prosecutorial endeavor on display so that mm. the entire community can hold them accountable to do the job that they are duty bound to do. So. Uh, just as a, in terms of the optics of it, I think that's terribly important. So one last, let, one ahead, last thing very quickly, we have, to, we have to eliminate uh, qualified immunity for police and prosecutors. There's too many cases of wrongful convictions where black people have spent decades in prison, often because of flagrant prosecutorial police misconduct. And when they get released from prison, because the prosecutor is an agent of the state, they're immune from prosecution. And we have to figure out a way in cases where there is evidence of intentional prosecutorial or police misconduct, we have to figure out a way to hold police departments accountable, whether that be through civil litigation and financial remuneration for people, or in some other way, 
we have to figure out how to get that done. If we don't do that, then I think we're missing a real opportunity for change as it relates to the criminal justice system. I had another sort of theoretical point I wanted to make, but I'll wait until later in the discussion for that. So those okay. are my two suggestions. I got you. So, so what I heard was preliminary hearings are public, grand jury um, hearings are, are private or, or not public. Yeah. Yes, and, and I okay. should also say that I'm not talking about abolishing grand jury, the use of the grand jury right. for everything, just in police abuse cases, because grand juries are often necessary to prosecute organized crime, to protect witnesses, many of whom are black witnesses, right? To right. protect them from, from any sort of uh, revenge or anything like that. And so right. I'm not talking about abolishing grand juries as such, but I'm talking about curtailing the use of them to improve public perception of how the process works for black people in police abuse cases. So, so transparency, accountability, yes. that we all we all weigh in on that. That's I, I got that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push it a little bit further um, for the for the officers that are here, um, and probably even for some of our pastors, um, because you know I've always said it's sermons that I preach from. So I was not in St. Louis at that time. I'd already left. Uh, but I remember sermons and, 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 and I was motivated, you know, to begin to speak out. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I don't have any law background or anything. It was just in my, in my heart, in my spirit, you know, and I, I wonder if there is a way, um, someone mentioned last night, Pastor Lola Moore Johnston, who preached for us last night, said that we just need to go to the police departments, uh, go to the court and just pray, just you know, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Is there a way um, that we can, can, can change the hearts, even as we're waiting to change some of the laws, even as we, you know, so we're going to go to, to jury duty. We're going to, you know, make sure that, that if we're called for, uh, to be a grand jury uh, participant, man, that we, we don't try to get out of it. Uh, so to our officers, uh, what, how can we help to officers and folk that are in the police department uh, to, to see me as a valued life? Is that too, and maybe some of the pastors and, you know, uh, Courtney, you're, 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 a prof you're a professor, you're about to be a pastor as well. So, so officers, help, help us out officers. How can we help? Um, for me, it's simple. It's all about relationships. Um, I think there's a, a, a saying, rules without relationships equal rebellion. And I believe that wholeheartedly. I think when we're talking about culturally, as far as the divide that exists between the white culture and African-American culture, I think it simply comes down to people don't know what they don't know. Mm. People fear what they don't understand. Okay. And so I think it's our responsibility. We talked a lot about transparency. We talked a lot about accountability, and I agree wholeheartedly with all those things, but I'm going to flip it on you because I think there needs to be accountability on both sides of it. I think many times, just like Judge was saying, that people don't get out and be a part of the process. There's oftentimes people we want to sit back and we don't want to speak. We don't want to use our voice. But when it's convenient for us, we want to get, get up, we want to kick, scream, and make all kinds of noise. But at that point, it's too late. Whatever has happened has already happened. So if we wait till these high-profile incidents occur, and then we want to stand up and use our voice, well, it's too late then. Of course, I'm not naive enough to know that it doesn't exist all throughout the process, but we cannot let it die down. We've been going on strong for, what, three or four weeks now, but ultimately, what usually happens, hopefully it doesn't happen in this situation, we fizzle out, we die down. Our voice matters. In order for we, us to make the other individuals know that our voice matters, we have to be willing to go out and feed those relationships. So if that means going out to police department, that means going out having conversations so that when these officers come in contact with people of color, the only context that they are coming in contact with, the only context in which they're coming in contact with us is usually at the hands of some sort of criminal incident. So we mm -hmm. have to balance that out. We have to make mm -hmm. sure that our contacts are more than just criminal. But if we don't want to put the effort, we don't want to put the time, we can't do that. Something I also mm -hmm. say is very simple. The test is open. Anybody can take the test. 
I get a lot of people who they try to tell us how to do the job of a police officer and never have experienced anything that we go through. I have lived on both sides of this equation. I've lived as a black man. I've lived as a police officer. And it's very hard to just view it from one perspective. That doesn't negate the history of the life that we have experienced at, as, as, as black people. But we have to be willing to give a different um, perception other than just the sole perception that they, they, that they some police officers have. So um, mm. relationships is a big thing for me and finding any way to cultivate and feed those relationships in a positive manner, I think will mm. go a long way. It's not the answer. It's not the only answer. There's no mm. one answer. I just think we all have to do our part and be willing to do mm. something. And then hopefully collectively when we come together, we will see that progress that we desire. Wow. Elder Josiah. Yeah, go ahead, Robert. Thank you, Yuri. Go ahead, Robert. I may have one answer. Uh, well, you know both my children. You know, my daughter Chelsea's in her 30s and my son Robert is in his 20s. Just like every parent that's on this panel or every parent that's watching this broadcast, you want your child to come home at the end of the day. Am I not correct? You want your child to come home at the end of the day. Even if your, your, your son or your daughter is 40 is in their 50s. One word, and that's called compliance. You can mention Ms. Brooks, you can mention Mike Brown, you can mention Mr. Floyd. The word is compliance. When did put your hands behind your back become a fight for a police officer? So the laws are already written on the books. And like the judge yielded to say, the judge is going to sit on the bench where a defense attorney presents, well, first the prosecution, they present their arguments, then the defense attorney presents his arguments. The books already have the laws written. The evidence that's presented in court is what the judge tells the jurors that they have to go by before they deliberate. Public opinion doesn't matter in a court of law. What matters is what evidence the prosecution presents and what evidence that the defense attorney presents. And then the judge gives his instructions as to what the elements of a crime is that the, that the defendant committed. And the oh. juries have to deliberate on that. Not what Robert O'Kelly feels, but what arguments did the both parties feel. But if we want our young black men, our young black women, all people to come home at the end of the day and dealing with law enforcement, you have to comply. If we don't see compliance, and I'm gonna say this as a Seventh-day Adventist, it's raining right now, but the storm is still coming out of Joe Science. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> could, I, could, I, could I just, could I just- Wow. Try? Okay, <laughs> let, me, let, me get, let me get Claudia, Tim, and then pass the water. Man, so I really appreciate what you said, um, Officer O'Kelly. I think one of the things that I'm, I know I'm struggling with is I know that I grew up with that same, um, that same advice, but if I look at Breonna Taylor, who was asleep in her bed and got bullets in her body because of a no knock warrant drug raid, at that point, I guess, I feel like some black people are, are, are a bit over the command to behave better. And I think that whenever we have these conversations, it's often, okay, well, black people, if you guys just behave better, then you'll live and you'll be able to get home. But it's like, there are so many cases where if I behave right, I actually don't live. I still die. I still have an issue so that, so that, it can't always just be black people behave better. At some point it has to be officers behave better. At some point it has to be the system behave better uh, because I, I have too many names in my head to list off of people who behaved perfectly fine and were completely compliant and still lost their lives. Good point. And, and, and we're gonna go to Tim, but I think the something I don't want y'all to miss, I think officer uh, O'Kelly is dealing with you have a higher probability when you do comply. If So I, I'm a black man, I'm, I'm, I'm in the gym, I'm coming back from, from the conference center. Uh, and if I don't comply, my chances, even though I, I still wanna get home to my family, I don't, I don't think, you know, I don't have any warrants out. So I think I'm getting home, I think I'm good. 
But if I don't comply, that makes it worse. But there are cases, as Claudia said, when you know uh, Botham Gene is, is is another one, and uh, there are many others where compliance wasn't even an option, uh, and they they ended up dead. Uh, and, and so, but no, I feel you. I feel you, Claudia. Tim, go ahead, and then uh, yeah. then, then pass the waters. I mean, uh, uh, Tatiana Jefferson was at home playing video games with her with her nephew at one o'clock in the morning. Uh, she heard a noise. Uh, she lives in Texas. Everybody and their grandmama in Texas got a gun in their house. She did what any self-respecting white Second Amendment NRA gun owning member would have done. Reached for her gun. She was shot and killed. Botham Jean was eating a bowl of ice cream in his own house. And he was shot and killed. Philando Castile was completely compliant following all the protocols of Minnesota law because he knew he had a weapon. And before he could even reach for his license to carry the weapon, to show it to the officer, the officer shot through past his girlfriend with his baby in the back, with her baby in the back seat and killed him. Uh, I have a real concern that respectability politics, which is the right hand of victim blaming, uh, makes I have a concern about how that makes its way into the discourse about how we talk about these incidents. And uh, what's even more disturbing is how it makes its way into sermons and how sermons take respectability politics and recast it as the word of God. So you're black and you're a black woman or man and living in this world of hostility towards you and you go wait well, I guess nowadays you don't go to church you log on on Sabbath to hear a sermon and the message that you hear is telling you that you're not acting right or to pull your pants up or to do whatever it is that has to be done and people walk away from that encounter with God not refreshed and renewed, but just feeling worse about themselves than when they came. So I have, a, I have a real concern about the way that we talk about these issues. That's not to say uh, that people shouldn't comport themselves a certain way, but it is to say that we come very close to uh, maintaining the status quo when we speak about these incidents in that manner. Um, the other thing I wanted to make, and this is where I think you're right, uh, uh, Officer O'Kelly, um, the legal system does not exist to vindicate our moral outrage. It doesn't. Uh -huh. The police officers who are arrested in the Rayshard Brooks case, for example, they have rights. They have the right to lawyers. They're going to be entitled to a vigorous defense. And in the end, when they're, when and if they are acquitted, everybody's going to be upset. People might be angry, whatever. But that's the way the legal system is designed to work. It is oh. not there to make us feel better. It is there to adjudicate abstract rights and responsibilities that show up in the concrete lives of individuals that have moral implications to be sure. Now, will it be, was it right that the officers in the Rodney King case were acquitted? No, it wasn't right, but it was legal. And we have oh. to understand at some point the oh. profound difference between legality and morality. I think the people who are on this panel and who are also passionate about social justice are doing what they do because of a moral compulsion. It just so happens that there is this thing, right, in the American legal system that we have to reckon with. And uh, I like Pastor, um, Pastor Laravo's point about the distinction between optimism and hope. You know. James Baldwin also said that if we're going to, uh, that the future of America depends upon white people having the courage to ask themselves why it was necessary to have a nigger in the first place. 
Mercy. And he said, because I am not the nigger. And if you call oh. me a nigger, that means you made it up. And if you made it up, that means you think you need them and you white people have got to find out why. So my lack Ooh. of optimism, <laughs> my lack of optimism is precisely because of the fact that without the nigger, there is no America. The nigger, America depends on the nigger. America depends upon a permanent underclass. From 1619 to 1787, when the constitution was adopted is a period of 168 years. And the constitution did not manumit one slave. Instead, what it did was it ensured the perpetuity of slavery oh. by legislating our subhuman status as at the very foundation of the document. So, so the, the nigger, the slave, is the condition for the very possibility of America. You cannot, you cannot have America. The day that the nigger is gone is the day that America has gone. America does not function at its best despite racism. America functions at its best because of racism. And oh, so yeah. we, we have to, we have to be, again, I'm, my, I am. I like Pastor Laravo's distinction between optimism and hope. And what I will what I will offer along those lines is that I am not hopeful about this moment that such that I believe it will cause an end to racism, because we have yet to see the neo fascist backlash. It's coming, oh. and it's coming oh. strong. Oh. Uh, right? uh, uh. We have yet to see the neo-fascist backlash. And yes, we serve a God who is able, and I agree with all of that. But what I will say to you is that my hope is not in that America will ever really be good, because I don't think America can ever be good. I think she can be better, but I don't think she can be good. And if we take Revelation 13 seriously, then we have to make certain theological concessions to tell us we might be able to work to make America better, but we can't make America good. And so for me, my hope is in the struggle against anti-Black racism in America. My hope uh, is that we will all leave this conversation with a renewed fervor to try to accomplish the impossible, which is fight perpetually against the system that perpetually fights against us. Because remember, if there is no nigger, there is no America. Ooh, we want a very condition for the possibility of this country. Wow. So I like the way Claudia put it. Claudia wrote a blog not long ago. And sis, if I can just, if I can just shout you out here for a minute. She couched it in terms of John 1-1, right? In the I think, Claudia, I think you said in the beginning was racism. Right, and in the, in the beginning in the, was slavery. In the beginning was slavery. Right. If I can just if I can just say that a different way, Claudia, and I got to give you credit because your blog blew me away. In the beginning was the nigger, and the nigger was with America, and the nigger was America. The same Woo! was in the beginning with America, and then <laughs> down in verse fourteen of John one it says, "And the word was made flesh." I'd like to put it this way. And the nigger was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his, his shame, his and her shame and degradation. The only begotten of America, full of shame and humiliation. Oh, my. That's from the gospel <laughs> according to whiteness. One, one and one fourteen. My there Lord. has to be a theological reckoning with this country and a mm. profound realization as Claudia pointed out in her blog piece, that the nigger is needed for America to be who and what she is. My goodness. Okay, so, whoo, that, that, that's a lot. That, you just dropped, I don't, man, so you remembered everything that you read. I read Claudia's blog too, but I couldn't, re I couldn't give you back. The hey, word. Preacher, preacher, Claudia, Claudia's blog, Claudia don't even know, Claudia's blog changed my life. The Bible Come says, on, man. The Bible says the word of God is swift and sharper than any two-edged sword. Wow. I, I got so many cuts on me from reading that blog of hers that day. I, Mercy. I, Mercy. I, got, 
I need to, I need to get a giant thing of peroxide from the grocery store. Just let me. <laughs> let me, let me so let I just get, want to thank you, Claudia, for for that. Thank you. Word that you brought because it's helped me to conceptualize what oh. I believe is the permanence of racism in America. Wow. Uh, let let go ahead, go ahead, Pastor Waters. Then I want to come to to Dr. Ty and and Dr. Ray. Um, go go ahead, and I'm gonna come. I'm gonna make mine short there because the question was asked, what can we do? And I'd like to just, you heard the slogan in politics, all the above. I think we have to keep at every level of trying to make change. And on a practical sense, one of the things that as a pastor of a church, knowing that even Assembly Adventists, I'm in the minority, I had to ask myself, what can I do where I am? Yeah, I can get out and protest and do all of that, but you got a church of 200, what difference are you gonna make? So one of the things that I did, uh, I haven't done any other place but here, I joined a group called the Empowerment Network. It's a network uh, that was put together by a gentleman who said, listen, let me look at all the issues that we are affected with, not only just the policing there, but we got housing, unemployment, We've got medical school, and I think there's about eight sections of this, like an octopus's arm there. I belong to the faith community. So it's a bunch of churches that we all belong to. We look at these, and I kind of like it like my father, who always tells me, to build a house, you need specialists in every area. You need plumbers, roofers, uh, carpenters, electricians, brick masons, uh, architects. Uh, those who laid the frame, the cement, and all of those got to work together because mm. in defense of, I see my brothers with the police department coming from a military side family who deals with, you know, structure, I'm talking about serious structure there. Uh, one of the things, as I shared early with you, I found out relationship and in our empowerment network, pastors, we mingle, we have lunch with department sergeants, with their men, we mingle and we know. So in the event, and I have, thank God I've had relationship because I've had a couple of members get in trouble. I can pick up the phone and call a detective, say, hey, listen, I know such and such, you gotta let me in, such and such. And not that I get uh, special treatment or whatever, but relationship building goes a long way. I sit with the commander of the Omaha Police Department every first Friday of the month. Mm. We get a chance to talk it out, air out some concerns. And of course, like I said, we've even had uh, my church, we did a summit. We did a summit and we didn't do it when there was this uh, tension in the air. And guess what? We barely got anybody. Now, of course, churches are having summits now with police departments. They're packed out because they're all frustrated. And I think one of the problems I hate to say with our church, uh, we are reactionary. In other words, something got to happen for us to be there. But I have found out, and I'll give you this quick one and I'll turn it over. We had a school that was going bad, well, uh, with us in it. They told us as pastors, we can come in. Now, I knew, I knew about four or five of those kids because I'm their pastor. And you know, they're cutting up and everything. But when I go into the school, they see me. And guess what? We have turned that whole school around. So guess what? It's going to take everybody on the ground level. It's going to take everybody, uh, just like this group. They deal with the Black Lawyers Association, Black Legislation, uh, Black Police Department. Uh, it's about all of us working together. And I believe if we do that, Mm. And we can make a dent. We can definitely, and I hope it doesn't take the killing of someone for a community to rise up. Because if mm. you start building a relationship, and not to say that's not going to happen. Yes, if it does happen, we do need to rise. But I think we can do a whole lot. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of care. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, Pastor Bolgen. I want you to weigh in with the uh, the pastoral and the not just pastoral, but but Pastor Waters talked about the relationship. Uh, Officer Ulrich Hunt talked about building relationships. Um, so I want to go to 
I, wa I want you to follow up to Pastor Waters, uh, Pastor Bojan, and then uh, Doctors Ty and and Doctor Courtney uh, as well on that on that same on that same vein. Go ahead, go ahead, Pastor Bojan. As far as relationships with the police department, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, those of us that are in ministry, uh, I, I completely agree that, you know, community, community policing is definitely something that is, should be a priority. I remember when um, I drove up to my church a few weeks ago and I saw a police officer in the, in the parking lot and my initial reaction, you know, was, <laughs> what what is he doing here but I you know I drove up and I was you know I introduced myself you know I'm, I'm the pastor of the church new pastor here and I was able to uh develop uh the 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 start of a relationship it turns out that he was that this is like I think the terminology this is his beat I think is what they say mm -hmm. um, um and so he was you know just just patrolling and so it was good to be able to make his acquaintance and you know he sees my face I know his face and I think that's, you know, going to be the start of something awesome. And so I do believe that as, you know, we're not only called to be pastors of our church, but we're called to be leaders in our community. And part of being leaders in our community is developing relationships with people that serve in our community so that we can have more of an impact, not just within our pews, within our four walls, but outside the four walls as well. So I'm definitely an advocate for um, developing strong uh, relationships. And I think also, especially within the Adventist system, um, to add to that, because we, we turn over so much, which can have um, a, a negative impact on relationships that are built, I think it's important you know, if, if I were to have to leave down the road at some point, I think it's important to say, hey, you know, make that make continue to make those connections so that those relationships remain um, fruitful and don't die off, especially within, you know, how we how we do church and how we how we lead. So. Mm, mm. Well, look, we're we going to give you a lot of time to develop that relationship. You Thank don't you. Have to <laughs> You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> we good. We Thank good. You. We good. That, oh yeah, because that relationship, man, is is is, is key. Doc, doc, Dr. Courtney, Dr. Ty, you know, if you want to respond to the to the relationship piece, for both of you, I'll serve as 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 pastor, lay lay pastor, uh, and but you also in that academia uh, as well. And if you want to speak to something that 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 Tim, uh, I'm looking in the chat, man, and and, and Tim, boy, they. They want to know if you still got a job. Uh, so, so go ahead, Dr. Ty and then and, and Dr. Ray. Yeah. So, I, my, my, Dr. Tim just 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 you know said a lot, right? And um, yeah, I want to try to I want to try to help to translate a little bit of that practically because I know we have a pretty broad audience out there, and I appreciate you, Dr. Tim. I think one of the most powerful things that you shared um, as it relates to you know the, the Tatiana Jeffersons and the others, which which frames the reality that Black death um, happens in various contexts, is to juxtapose that to the, the Dylan roofs and the, the realities of the, the brothers who walk up in, you know, in, in Lansing, Michigan with big old you know, you know, uh, guns on their arms demanding that the state be open and shouting in the police's face. And rocket launchers on their arms. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, think, I think that's an important piece that um, you know, relationship is important. I think proximity matters. I mean, when we look at the Rashad Brooks situation, I mean, they talked to that brother for you know a, a good bit of time. Like it wasn't a there was a, there was a, a conversation, maybe not a long relationship, but I've talked to other law enforcement folks who would suggest that they would have done something differently in that situation, right? So relationships uh, and proximity matter, but there is a devaluing of black life that's grounded in the history of this country that makes it far easier for folks to pull a gun or to pull the trigger when they see a black person in any uh, situation, whether it be potentially questionable or not. We are not giving that benefit of the doubt. So I, I believe that relationship is possible, right? Uh, and important. Uh, but I want to add to that. I want to give you a few R's to add to that. Like relationship matters. I, I've been blessed to serve as a lay pastor in, in, in Columbia, Missouri. There is no central stage church uh, in this particular space. Uh, and so I've had the privilege of working with my white brothers and sisters in the Iowa, Missouri conference. And proximity has given me access and opportunities to have some important conversations. I mean, I, you know, there, I would potentially preach at times in Black History Month. And one of the things I would say like, is like, if you've never, uh, and I preach that other times as well, not just Black History Month, let me clarify. Uh, but there were times where I said, listen, like, if you have not considered 
the sole salvation of both Michael Brown and Darren Wilson, then you need to consider the quality of your Christianity, right? And I could say that because of the context of relationship that I'm challenging them to say, hey, listen, like what does it look like for you to be a part of the solution? Because again, yes, there are things that we need to be doing as people of color. Yes, we need to do things we need as black folks. But I believe it's time that we also have to challenge our white brothers and sisters as well. And part of that, I believe, if you go with some other artists, include re-education, like, like, like the history of racism in this country and understanding that. There are, there's a lot of crazy stuff that also many of us as black folks have had to learn and unlearn as you understand the history of this country. Um, uh, there was a, 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 a pretty dynamic conversation, Pastor Josiah, that uh, I believe was inspired by uh, uh, Dr. Tiffany Llewellyn's uh, post around the tensions related to Caribbean folk yep. and folks who came from Africa and, and our African-American brothers and sisters, right? Like, so we need to understand white supremacy, that ideology, that belief system has infected many of us. And I believe it's vital that the red education that takes place for not just our people, but uh, not just for white folks, but also for our people. So I wanna, I wanna highlight the need for re-education. Uh, in that process, uh, framing or language like critical race theory, right? Which talks about um, uh, the, the permanence of racism, which uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Golden mentioned, but also the significance of property, right? The significance of property in this country. And so I wanna ask us to think of what does it look like to re-educate, to think about and understand how even the property structure in this country, the, 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 how the neighborhoods have been set up. These things can help our white brothers and sisters to better understand that what we see, the, 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 the uh, disparities that we see are not just based on folks not working hard or not just because they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, but there are systematic realities, stuff like redlining and blockbusting. And as an educator who teaches uh, predominantly white students, I mean, sometimes they don't get it until we do activities. I shared this example uh, in a previous uh, uh, panel uh, in a similar space where we played a monopoly game with a step start we have uh, two, a group of two, maybe two or three students who start the game and then they're buying up the property, they're having a good old time, they're buying up, you know, boardwalk or whatever. And then another group gets to come in and gets to come and take all their property after a little bit of time. And you have these two groups who are wrestling for uh, 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 dominance, right? And they play, they're having a good time, they're, you know, they're, they're jockeying for position. And then finally, when most of the property is gone, we bring in a third group of people who come into the game and now it's only maybe like Bold, Baltic uh, Avenue left or whatever. And you see the, how the game uh, uh, gets pretty interesting when the folks who've entered the game last begin to get frustrated because they can't participate in the structure. And they begin to say stuff like, I'll rather be in jail than to continue to land on your property. And it's not until those moments, for example, that some of my white students get it. Now, let me ask you this question. In the remnant, right? As we talk about our truths and the like, have we ever considered how white supremacy, how the, uh, 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 the lack of teaching in these areas, in our schools, for example, have, have manifested themselves, not just in what we hear from the pool people, what happens in our Adventist schools, uh, how they see salvation uh, or who is redeemable. Like these are things that we need to think about as it relates to re-education. I believe we need to also think about how we can reimagine our ministry context. What does it look like to engage in the both and? There are systematic realities, there are structural realities, but there are also individual things that we can do, particularly as it relates to the lives of our young brothers and sisters we as we have relations with them. Let me give you an example in our gallery of eight. So I, I am of the opinion, I'm very concerned that as a result of COVID-19 and the fact that our people have been cooped up for, you know what I'm saying, four months, three months, uh, folks, money's gotten funny, like I'm really concerned that we're gonna see a proliferation of violence, particularly in our spaces and those who have been economically most disenfranchised as the heat of the summer increases, we're gonna see some stuff. And you know what the first thing you're gonna see, you're gonna hear from others, and you, you probably heard it already is, here we go, black on black crime, or here we go again, right? And you're gonna hear that narrative. And again, those things need to be contextualized. And I'm not, a, again, both and, but if we're leaders and we have relationships, what does it look like to create systems of heat and alternatives? So for me, in my city, that looks like, uh, I'm, I'm really thinking about like some type of Saturday night basketball league where we close out the Sabbath, um, you know, we're, you know, we're giving a little encouraging word and we're not just waiting for the back to school explosion, Pastor Josiah, but mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're playing basketball on Saturday nights. We've got the lights on at the very park where there was a shooting last night. I was at, at the park on Wednesday night talking to a young brother who got shot this weekend. And one of the other young brothers who also is potentially involved with young brothers that we're working with. So for me, I'm thinking about the both and 
how can I also system interrupt the system structures to connect mm. with the people I have relationships with so that there are alternatives as we also re-educate our white brothers. No, let me fix that, because I don't think it's our responsibility to re-educate them, but I believe we need to invite our brothers and sisters in our church. We, we claim to be the remnant, but we've never really critically reflect, reflected on how white supremacy has undergraded all that we've done in this country. All that we've done in this country has been birthed out of that reality. And so we have to attend to that and, and, and consider that as factors that impact not just our ideology, but who we think is worth being saved. And so as we have relationships, and they say, oh, Dr. Ty, you're a professor or whatever. I'm also saying, oh, yeah, but Mike Brown was no different from my son. So don't say it's okay if he lays in the street, but I, I, I'm a good one. No, that's not how it works. So I'm, I'm, I'm strategically positioned. And I believe mm. each of us have a role to play in these conversations as we also challenge those who look like us and also those who don't to do better. Mm, mm. Relationship, re-education, re-imagination. Dr. Courtney. Go ahead and weigh in. So yeah, I definitely co-sign a lot of what has been going on and what's been said already, because um, many of the things that are, talk, are being talked about are going beyond kind of the protest. And even though protesting is good, even though this moment is good, even though it's, I'm glad that we have kind of this zeitgeist that's going on where people are energized, the important thing, one of the important things to realize is that this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. And so it can't just be for this moment, we're all rah, rah, rah. And then, you know, two or three months down the line, we kind of get relaxed and we're like kind of complacent because Starbucks allowed people to wear Black Lives Matter shirt and, you know, Ben and Jerry's gave people Juneteenth off. You know, that's not what yeah. this is. This is um, the, tr us trying to restructure something that has been intentionally structured to be um, the way it is. So we often talk about how the system is broken, but no, the system is working exactly as it was designed to work. And so for us saying that we want something different, that means that we're trying to um, disturb the way that something was designed and to rebuild it again. And that comes with um, not just as, as Dr. Douglas was saying, not just a decolonization of the systematic things, but also <coughs> sociological things and the psychological things that we are internalizing all the time because this is the just the milieu that we all live in, we exist in. So that's not just police officers, that's not just white people, that's us too. And mm -hmm. one of the things that um, I want to go back to what uh, Tim Golden said was, you know, when we hear a lot of sermons, one of the things that we do hear a lot of is, you know, talking about do better, be better. These kinds of things will help you to get stay out of trouble. And I'm not advocating trouble, obviously, right? right. But I'm also saying that we need to try to make sure that we are not reinforcing stereotypical, negative, and also inaccurate information about ourselves. Because when we're looking at the Bureau of Justice Statistics, we know that about 80% of crimes that are against Black people are by Black people. So yeah, Black on Black crime. But 80% of the crimes against white people are committed by white people as well. And 80% of the crimes of, that are against Hispanic people are committed by Hispanic people as well. And so we are often told narratives about ourselves that reinforce stereotypical beliefs, even among ourselves. And even as we are trying to help each other, we will sometimes reinforce those same negative things. And so it's important for us to not just accept what's said to us. Like, you know, and those of you who remember Ronald Reagan came up with the whole idea of the welfare queen. Well, more white people are on welfare than black people, but that's still in the minds of people today. When you talk about welfare, that's immediately what comes to mind is, oh, some black woman in the projects with seven kids. You know, this, this idea that we have created in our minds, even the myth of the absent black father 
is one that is very pervasive in the Black community. And we talk about that so much where, oh, we need to have more Black dads. Black, black fathers are more involved with their children than any other ethnic group. When we look wow. at the data of child involvement with parents, when, when you're accounting for, when you're looking at parents who are in the home with fathers or children who are in the home with their fathers, and when you're looking at children that are out, whose fathers live outside the home, when you look side by side, black fathers are more involved in their children's daily lives. And that's not something that you hear. You hear all of this other kind of stuff. And when we live in a society that reinforces that, when it comes from our churches, when it comes from the pulpit, when it comes from our parents, when it comes from our teachers, when it comes from us and the mainstream media, then of course that's gonna be in the minds of people when, I mean, judges are affected by what they hear. They don't live in a silo. <laughs> they don't live right. in a bubble. Police officers don't live in an isolated place. They hear this kind of stuff too. So all of these negative imagery, even if we don't are, are not aware of it, it's what we call um, intrinsic bias. So the things that we don't are not aware of, the implicitness, the implicit biases are the things that I don't know. I'm reacting to it, but it's not necessarily conscious in my mind. But if everything I'm hearing, all the stuff all the time that's going through the airwaves, every story that I hear, every sermon that I hear is that black people need to be better because they're not good enough or that they are criminals and they need to be better when they need to comply. If everything is telling me that black people are not as good, then when I come in contact with a black person, even if I'm a black person myself, there's going to be that implicit narrative that's in my head that's going to change the way that I view them rather than a white person. And so it's important for all of us to do what wow. we can to change the narrative. So that, because it's not just the fact that I build a personal one on one relationship with a police officer. That's all well and good because there's lots of white people who will say, oh, yeah, I like you. <laughs> you're good. You're not like the rest of them because there is a one on one relationship. But what about everyone else? So we have to change the narrative of the way that we are perceived and the way that we talk about ourselves to ourselves and to the wider community. Because I think that that's the only way that we're going to really see people because we can even change laws and we can do all these kinds of things. But if you are continually thinking these things about a certain group, if you continually buy into that bias, no matter what you tell yourself consciously, those implicit biases are going to find themselves working themselves out where you shoot that black guy, where the guy with the AK-17 strapped to his back who's white, oh, this guy, he's okay. Let's, let's you know, he's not gonna do anything. So those biases are always in the back of our mind and we have to change those by bringing them to the forefront and change the conversation and change the, the descriptions of ourselves by ourselves in our communities and outside. Wow, wow. So I heard intrinsic bias and implicit bias. Mm -hmm. I, am I right? Okay, because I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes, which means that we've got some work to do ourselves as a, as a people to, 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 to change the biases, um, if that's the plural of bias, I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. uh, so that we, we can come out of that, uh, that funk, that mindset. Um, and, and let me just, let me just real quick, just even talk about how, you know, this happens, we see the way that this plays out where we've done experiments where you have somebody and you tell them like, let's say I have a, a a ninth grade girl, right before she, she might be the best in her class. And, and before she takes a math test, we talk about how girls aren't really, don't really do well in math. They're not really that smart in math. And you can talk about that, not talk about her, but just the fact that she's heard this, 
even if she is good in math, we will see a decline in her performance because she heard that about the people that she identifies with. When you are hearing things about yourself constantly, even if you feel like, oh, I don't believe that about myself, those things have an effect. It's a measurable effect on the way that you perform, the way that you behave, the way that you live your life, the way that you see yourself, even if you are not consciously aware of it. So we need to stop talking about ourselves in a negative light because it is affecting us even if we're not aware of it. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a whole lot of nuggets right there. Okay. So we got about 13 minutes. I, I, I wasn't trying to get to two hours, but but I know I know having a large panel was going to be interesting. Uh, I've never had one this big. But I think it was necessary because we needed all of the perspectives, even if you didn't speak for 30 minutes each, um, because our audience represents all of the perspectives that are around this table. So this is like, you know, just sitting at the dinner table uh, at a family reunion, and you got all the perspectives. So, so I appreciate you guys, but I gotta, I gotta ask you this uh, and then, 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 then we'll, we'll jump off. Uh, there are many professed Christians who are tone deaf and see no moral issues surrounding the racial tensions that we see. People have said, we need to stay out of it. This is a, this is a law enforcement issue. This is a political issue. We shouldn't be involved. Uh, and I remember E.E. E. Cleveland speaking years ago uh, about how he prevented his students who wanted to go and march. Um, he didn't let them go and he regretted doing that later on uh, because at that time the church's stance was, you need to stay out you know, of the quote unquote political uh, uh, arena. So, so everybody, if this is even possible for about a minute or two, <laughs> for about a minute or two, share with us, you know, how we as a, as a church family, of, of course, you guys know I've been the parole director here for the last four years. Uh, I've been engaged. I, I wasn't waiting on anything, you know, as we started doing our, our social justice conferences, the public affairs literacy, uh, Liberty uh, area. I was learning from Tiffany and, and Claudia and, and Jamie and, and Tim and Orlin and uh, and, and and Woody, uh, my, my friend up there in Lake Region. And so um, I felt passionate about it. Uh, and I had to teach some of our members that look justice and 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 fighting for justice and equality and fairness is biblical. Jesus's whole mantra, is Luke four eighteen. You know where where he has come in to to set the captives free, and so whatever you can share with us, tell us how we can help those who are listening, our members. And I'm looking on the line here; we got almost 300 people just in the YouTube uh, alone. Tim, go ahead, tell us yeah. how we can help our people um, with this question. I think we can help our people with this question, uh, Pastor, and just by acquainting ourselves with a little bit of history. You know, I, I love it when I hear people in the church say, particularly the white brethren, uh, who say, well, you know, these are these are political matters and we need to be concerned about, uh, you know, we, don't, we shouldn't concern ourselves with this. They say that in one breath and then in the next breath, they say, pastor, do you have my Sabbath accommodation letter? Mm. And the reality is that the Seventh-day Adventist church has always been political, always. It was political from the very beginning and it will remain political. Uh, let me just say this, and I think this, this is all I'm gonna have to say about this, but I, I hope it really hits home with us. In the 50s and 60s, when Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference were pushing for landmark civil rights legislation, the Seventh-day Adventist Church actively opposed involvement in that protest movement. Wow. And this is made clear in Sam London's book, Seventh-day Adventists and the Civil Rights Movement, right? He, he chronicles how E.E. E. Cleveland and other Black Adventist pastors were subject to church discipline because of their involvement in protest movements. And here's what's fascinating. It is the height of hypocrisy for the Seventh-day Adventist church on the front end to oppose a protest movement 
And then on the back end, today, every American, regardless of their race, every Seventh-day Adventist in America who has a job that is covered by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is entitled to a Sabbath accommodation. And as a church, we have a whole department, you referenced it, Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, that is set up to protect our free exercise of religion in the workplace so that we don't have to choose between our conscience and our employment. Uh -huh. Now, here's the hypocrisy. The law that protects our right to Sabbath observance in the workplace is the same law that grew out of a protest movement that we opposed. <laughs> So, so we oppose the protest movement on the front end and on the back end, we are one of the principal beneficiaries of the movement that we oppose. So you can miss me with the whole conversation about this is political because the church has always been political and will continue to be political when it wants to be. I can't tell you the amount of fights I have gotten into with white SDA Christian lawyers who have actually tried to compare the restrictions during the COVID-19 pandemic on leaving the house and public gatherings to what slaves struck, what newly freed slaves struggled against in reconstruction. I've actually had a white Adventist lawyer try to compare those two groups. I don't even know how I can begin to have that kind of conversation with you. So let's just understand that before we say we shouldn't be involved in politics, let's remember just how much every American Seventh Day Adventist benefits from political involvement. <laughs> That's a drop the mic. To, Go ahead, Claudia. Claudia and then Waters. Okay. I want to uh, follow uh, Dr. Golden's point. Um, I think that two things I'll be very short. One, there is a case from May uh, of 2019 with a gentleman named Don Jackson. He killed his wife, Connie, in 1984. Uh, Jackson was in prison on death row and became Seventh-day Adventist and then proceeded to uh, give Bible studies and was baptizing in the prison system and was bringing many to Christ. Um, when uh, our president, Ted Wilson, found out about this, he hand wrote a letter to the governor of Tennessee pleading on behalf of Don Jackson, requesting that he uh, be taken off death row uh, and just given life in prison. Um, not only did uh, President uh, Ted Wilson do this, but our president, Dan Jackson as well. Uh, and uh, their involvement actually went all the way up to the Supreme Court on behalf of Don Jackson. So I think that I use that as another example, a very recent example to evidence that as a church, we are not against political involvement. We are against political involvement that specifically has to do with black and brown bodies. And I think that that is something that as a church, we have to be willing to accept. And because we are not willing to accept our own inherent structural and systematic racism, we are unable to adequately approach deconstructing and dismantling racism within America at large. So we can come together, we can have all these panels, you guys can ask me 100,000 times, Claudia, what are some practical ways that we can dismantle racism? And I'm going to tell you what well, you first have to deal with you, <laughs> right? Um, I really want to re-emphasize what Dr. Ty Douglas and Dr. Courtney Ray said a bit earlier. Systemic racism operates, I believe, in four key ways. It is structural, it is institutional, it is interpersonal, and it is internal. This means that our approach to dismantling racism must be multiplicitous. It must be varied, okay? We
we have to uh, all kind of come together and identify what are the skills, what are the gifts that God has given me so that I can approach and, and, and engage in this thing, whether that is an internal, dealing with internal racism, whether that's dealing with interpersonal one-on-one -on -one experiences, whether that's dealing with institutions like the criminal justice system, like the education system, or whether that's dealing with structures like mass incarceration, uh, like le legislation. Um, there are a, a variety of angles in which we have to approach this thing. And I believe that there is plenty of scriptural evidence to support that we should be doing this work on all levels. From Genesis to Revelation, I see a God that is committed to directly attacking systems, governments, kingdoms, ideologies, and interpersonal exchanges that are oppressive and destructive to people. And so one of the ones that I absolutely love talking about is the cleansing of the temple. Uh, we like to always talk about how Jesus cleansed the temple because at that moment he was trying to articulate to the people at that time that he was the new sanctuary and that he was supposed to uh, become their new sacrifice. And while this is true, what also was happening at that time was that the religious leaders were in bed or hand in hand with the Roman Empire. And so at that moment, they had literally taken Passover and turned it to it turned it into a moment of economic exploitation. So now I am forcing you to pay for sacrifices at exorbitant prices that you no longer can afford so that now Passover, which is supposed to be a worship experience that brings you closer to God, is a worship experience that is only open for the rich and the wealthy. Jesus says, I see what you're doing. I see that you're not allowing the poor to have access to my presence, access into my temple. And so I'm going to make a whip I'm going mm -hmm. to turn over tables. I'm going on, to release man. animals. In essence, not only did Jesus lead out a protest, Jesus led out a riot. He was actively destroying property in the temple because he was displeased at the oppression that was happening to the poor. So when we talk about, do we wanna get involved in politics? Is it scriptural for us to get involved in politics? There is nothing in scripture that allows you to be silent, that allows you to be disengaged, that allows you to let the oppressed remain in oppression. So we've got to we've we've really got to uh, switch up our theology and and really get to a place where we're understanding that Christ left so that the Holy Spirit could fall upon me so that I might do greater works than he did. So if that is what he's expecting of me, then that means that I must be committed to rebuking oppression restoring the oppressed and replacing oppressive systems. That was the absolute complete ministry of Jesus Christ on the earth. And that is what I am called to do as a disciple. Mm. All right, all right. <laughs> Whoa, all right, we gotta breathe for a second. Just breathe for a second. Okay, okay, I saw Waters and then Dr. Ty, and I'm gonna uh, go to all the panelists uh, so that you can say, say some final words as well. Go ahead, Waters. Wow, I can go ahead and take my text. Actually <laughs> preaching through Esther for such a time as this. But I can say, first part of my ministry was just being an evangelist, just you know, winning people to Christ. And until I heard Dr. Laurie preach on, a sub, uh, preach on uh, don't remember the title, but he asked, are you an evangelist or a prophet? And as I listen, I distinctly, I think Adventists, we work in an evangelistic role. It's all about saving people. It's not about taking care where you sleep, where you get your food, but you just need to come to Christ. But as you know, a prophet deals where, wherever he is, an Amos or whatever, if there's injustice or whatever. And I can say on a very practical level as a pastor, we were always kind of taught, it's the no rule that you know, don't get into all of that. Don't open up to your church, you know, go to their churches. I can say probably since I've been here uh, for the last eight, nine years, I've been actively, I'm the one saying you can come to my church 
for the, uh, when we spoke to the police department, I opened up my church. My church has become the center when we deal with health issues. My church, uh, we just finished with the voter registration. My church is open. I, I'm telling folk that I gotta be the prophet because I live here. I've got to call out the injustices where I am. And I think if our people, now our people did rally one time because property values went up in a poverty stricken area and our folk only respond because they were upset. They were mad that taxes were going up. And, and I kind of told them, I said, quit being reactionary. I said, get in right now, make the difference now before the issue actually happened. I actually told him, I said, be a Mordecai, Mordecai. I said, he saw something whereby he put his niece Esther in play, knowing that things would go off, happen, had somebody there who had the ear of the king. So I would say to even every pastor who's listening, uh, don't be the evangelist, be the prophet. And mm -hmm. I believe being both prophet and evangelist will definitely make the difference. That means at where you are at. Mm, mm, Dr. Ty, preacher, that's good. Don't just be the evangelist, be the prophet. Go ahead, Doc. This is Rich. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Uh, Pastor Josiah, for having me. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. I just want to just, um, just, just conclude with a, a few quick thoughts. Uh, one, again, uh, I think it's important to remember that we are Protestants, Protestants, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Protest is uh, uh, embedded in even who uh, we identify as. I think it's important too uh, to consider um, how, you know, I, I, in the past I've been looking at the Good Samaritan story and how uh, it's very difficult for some folks to see us um, as, as their neighbors. Like when you think about the, again, I go back to how the housing market was stratified in this country and I'm concerned because I know we have some white brothers and sisters who are watching. I need you to understand that you may struggle to see us as your neighbor because we've never really been your neighbors. And that was systematically done by legal uh, 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 mandates, you know, that you have to understand were historically in place. So I need you to understand like, the, that, like connecting the Bible to today will give us freedom to actually understand how racism um, is, is, is not just embedded, but it actually impacts our capacity to minister. And so I'm, I'll be honest with you, as someone who has functioned in the, uh, in the white conference space, you know, by, by proxy effectively uh, and by requirement initially, uh, because there was no central states conference here, I've actually been greatly concerned about the soul salvation of my white brothers and sisters on these issues because they, they, they're not able to see it uh, mm. because of the, how they've been taught, right? So I wanna uh, broaden the conversation to like, like for us as black folks, I think this will help us to also not, um, to be able to take the anger and the frustration and to allow God to still help us have compassion because this is a salvific, salvific issue for our brothers and sisters. And I believe that they need to unlearn these things that they may also more, ex, more fully experience Christ. And I believe this process is actively happening. But in, the, in this last iteration of Uprising, this most recent iteration, I've been led to look at the story of Moses recently. I just want to read something real quick to you from Exodus chapter four. And I want to remind us that like uh, uprisings, uh, like liberation, like this isn't new, like 400 years for the children of Israel. Uh, it, it, there's some, a lot of parallels, right? Including reparations when they left Egypt, they didn't leave empty handed. I just want to just put that out there, right? Mm. But chapter four, verse 27 says, this is this, I want to help somebody because when someone asks you, how does this connect to the three angels messages? I want you to make sure that you get this in your spirit and have this in your arsenal because the three angels messages are about what, Pastor Jai? What is it about? Talk to me real quick. What is the three angels messages about? Fear God, worship. give glory, worship. Yep. Worship, right? Let me read mm -hmm. this to you. The Bible says, Exodus 4, 27. Now the Lord had said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. I think it's important that we do this work in partnership. Just want to encourage somebody, our leaders, don't worry yourself out. You can't do it on your own. You may need Aaron and Moses together. So Aaron went and met Moses at the mountain of God and he embraced him. These were brothers also who had some tension probably, you know what I'm saying, back in the day. One was maybe in the Caribbean, the other was African, you know what I'm saying? One was mm. raised in the house, the other was raised with the people, but they, they began to work that thing out. Moses then told Aaron everything the Lord had commanded him to say, and he told him about the miraculous signs the Lord had commanded him to perform. Watch this. Then Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt and called all the elders of Israel together. I believe it's the time we get the elders together. There's some, some, some truth telling passages that needs to happen mm -hmm. about the histories 
about, about the property that wasn't sold to black conference uh, leaders that, that impacted the fact that we don't have ministry uh, uh, platforms for our black people because property matters and our kids are, are desperate and they need a place to go. And the reality is Woo! these things literally happen in our conference spaces and in particular our, 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 our uh, 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 state conference spaces, and there needs to be honesty, not just apology, but to say, what does it look like to actually rectify that tangibly? I've been blessed to work with many who have helped to be a part of that process, but I want to push this one step further. The Bible says, and Aaron told them everything that God, uh, that uh, the Lord had told Moses, and Moses performed the miraculous signs as they watched. We love signs in Adventism. We love, we do our revelation seminars. We talk about the signs. Our children were taught about the signs. And they're, 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 they're told, when you see certain things happen, that's what you should know. But here's the, good, here's the good news. Then the people of Israel were convinced that the Lord had sent Moses and Aaron. When they saw the signs, Pastor Josiah, they were convinced. That's Whoa. okay. But listen uh -huh. to this. When they heard that the Lord was concerned about them <laughs> and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. Worship won't happen until we communicate to the people, our people, that God has seen our misery. We can yes. give them all the information. We can show them our miraculous signs. We can talk about 2300 day prophecy and all that good stuff. But until we communicate to our people, like Pastor Doug has said today, we actually meet their tangible needs first and help them to understand that it wasn't God's desire for us to experience what we've experienced, but he has heard our cry. He has seen yeah. our pain and he is with us. That's when they will worship. And every single time Moses went to Pharaoh, what did he say? Let my people go that they may do what? Worship. <laughs> worship. The three angels message. And I believe it's Come time on. that we do that rather than making people fearful with just the signs. Let mm. them know that God has heard our pain and it's time yes. to worship. Oh man, oh man, oh man. Yes, sir. I received that, my brother. Uh, let me get Officer Kelly. I know Officer Hunt, you're driving. Uh, and Kevin, uh, and then Dr. Ray. Um, any any parting words, man? Anything that for, to to help our people, you know, continue to be a part of of, of trying to make this change. Your your pastor. I um, early on, the judge said something important to Claudia about when you go into court and support individuals, know that person. I remember uh, a court case when the judge was about to sentence an individual and the attorney was speaking on behalf, the defense attorney was speaking on behalf of the family and he gave a, a long description of how, how great this individual was that he was about to sentence. And the judge stopped the attorney and he told the deputy sheriff to take the jurors out of the courtroom and once the jurors was gone, he asked the attorney and he looked at the family. He uh, said, where were you when he did this? Where were you when he did that? And now you want to present to me before this sentencing that he's a saint. I would like our Adventist members to pick wisely that which you defend because it's going to be adjudicated in a court of law and things that you don't know about the individuals that, that you're defending will come out. And I understand what you see in the media is devastating to see the life just taken out of someone. But our personal opinions doesn't matter when it ends up in a court of law. And, and in a court of law, things are going to come out this 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 that you may not want to see and you may not want to hear. So choose wisely those those fights that you choose. That you that you don't be quick to react to those those news footages and and the public opinion. You know, let, learn a little bit about the situation, but we take that fight and don't get yourself in harm's way. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, yeah, that's good, man. So build relationships uh, and, and be there, be there with 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 our with our people. Uh, before you get to the courtroom. Uh, I, I'm with you, man. I got it. I got it. Kevin, Judge, uh, or you, Rich, either one of you, which, who wants to go, go first? I, I'll, I'll let uh, Officer Hunt go. And any any parting words, Yurik, to, to help us, man, to, to make a difference? 
No, I think uh, what also Kelly was saying that he took the words right out of my mouth. It just it's accountability on all parts. We can't just wait to the end and be subjective or reactive just to one side of it. And that's just my biggest message. I think we all have, we understand and have lived the black experience. Mm. Now, what are we going to do? So what? Mm-hmm. We all have a part to play in it. So what part are we going to play? And we can't wait to just stand up, want something, be reactive in essence. Um, for me, I'm out here every day. Out here every day. I live these streets. I'm in the streets. I'm trying to make a difference, just doing my small part. I can only influence what my circle of influence allows me to influence. But hopefully mm-hmm. the people that I influence, therefore, goes and influence others. That way we can reach the masses. Um, but again, uh, also yes. Kelly, just, he, hit, he hit the nail right on the head as far as I'm concerned. Um, the final thing I'll just leave with you with, is this. is Emotion and logic can't coexist at the same time. We got to figure out and pick which one we're going to operate from. I think they both are important and they both are very real. But as we move forward, are we having an emotional conversation or are we having a logical conversation? We have to have both conversations, but we have to understand the perspective in which we're we're we're, we're operating from. So I, I just I, I just want to just Pasha, I, I think it's important for us to also question that. I, I I would I would disagree that emotion and logic cannot exist together. I think that's a that's a reflection of something called Platonic dualism. That's the Eurocentric uh, uh, framework that would suggest that we, we, emotion means that you're not logical. I, I think we need to be careful with that type of language because it suggests that uh, we're not thinking, we're not logical, even when we may express emotion, when we understand that some of our brothers and sisters of a lighter persuasion are typically a little bit less emotional and expressive, but that doesn't mean that they're more logical than us. I believe we have to be careful with the, with the deficit language that we use about how we approach uh, uh, these issues. Okay. Okay. Judge, thank you, Ty, for for, for weighing in on that. Uh, Judge Harold, just real quick, I'll, I'll I'll end with this. You know, we were talking about reform and change and things of that nature, and I think we, um, I think all those things have to happen, need to happen, and I hope uh, the momentum does not die, uh, and that we insist that it continue. But I, I don't want us to forget one thing when we talk about the system. It's not this you know, nebulous thing out there. The system is us. And I'm going to keep beating the drum that we have to participate. We are the system. We can make all the changes, law, we can do the training and all that, but the system doesn't run itself. We have to apply the system basically. And if we don't get involved, the system is what it is. Mm. So I'm, Mm. I'm just going to say, we are the system. So we can't keep saying change if we're not going to participate. Uh, and I'll end with that. Thank you for letting me participate. Yes, sir. I got that in bold, uh, underlined. Four words. We are the system. You might see that on a Facebook <laughs> post near, near you soon, man. Uh, I want I royalties for it, though. Uh, hey, I'll give you credit, man. I'll give you credit, Doc. <laughs> you know, um, and, and I've been convicted. I said it earlier that, that when I get my jury duty notice, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm in the office now, man. I, you know, I could create my own time. I'll talk to Elder Bernard. I, I get out of work so I can go and do, man, I'm convicted because we can't run away from something and then, and, and, and then, and then complain about that same thing, you know? And, and so that's fair, man. I, I received that. I received that. Now, Dr. Courtney, any, any parting words for us? Um, just a couple things. One, when you, talked about like the prophetic nature of what that's been said a, a, a couple different times. Um, mm-hmm. Claudia said it, um, uh, Dr. Douglas said it. Um, so many of you have made that connection that prophecy is part of our, um, our identity as Adam. Yes. And we talk about the identity of having the spirit of prophecy and many times we think that means date setting <laughs> for the second coming. And we tell people get ready for, um, you know, the time of trouble and all of that, which, you know, that's great. But when we look at the prophets of old, what they did most often was challenge the people of God. And so if we're talking about what prophecy means, we need to say that if this is a church that is prophetic, 
we need to challenge ourselves in how we're going to be active in the things that God asks us to do. And we often as Adventists will quote Isaiah 58, 13, you know, turn your foot from doing your pleasure on my Sabbath day. And it's like we skipped all the other verses before that because all the other verses talk about the fact that the people are asking God, they're like, God, we're doing this. We seek you day by day to delight to know your ways as a nation. We've done righteousness. We haven't forsaken your ordinances. And God, we ask you for just decisions and, the, and they delight in being close to God. And they say in verse three, we fasted and you don't see, we've humbled ourselves, but you don't notice. And God says on the day of your fast, you find your desire and you drive all your workers hard. You fast for contention and strife. You mm. don't fast like you do today to make your voice heard. Is this the fast that I have chosen for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed? Is it for spreading out sackcloth and ashes? Will this be the fast that's acceptable to the day of the Lord? He says, isn't this the fast that I choose? To loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke and to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. God is saying, I w all this other stuff that y'all are doing, that's great, but that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking mm -hmm. you to actively lift up those who are oppressed. And when we as Adventists abdicate that responsibility, we're not really embodying what it means to be a prophetic church because prophetic churches are the ones that listen to the voice of God and say, how can I live out what God wants me to do in the world and telling other people, not just about the nearness of Christ, but telling them that we are there to help them out of oppression, to help yes. them to break the yokes of bondage. And that's what I feel like we have not wanted to do for such a long time. And that's exactly what God says, this is what my people need to do. And I don't think it's coincidental, to be honest. I'm, I'm you know, I don't know all the ways of God, but in Isaiah 58, God says, you know, your fasts and all the ceremonies you do are not what I want. I want you to be concentrated on this. So I don't think it's coincidental that we're in a place right now where we can't do all our little traditional things and we can't mm. gather the way that we usually do and mm. we can't go through our performances of worship at this time because mm. all of those things That's are good. nice distractions from wow. what God actually asks us to do. And so if we were doing the work that we were supposed to do, then maybe we wouldn't be so caught up in all the other stuff. Everybody's like, I want to get back to the sanctuary. I want to get back to the church. How about we get back to doing what God asked us to do in the first place and Hello. lifting up the oppressed and setting the captives free. That's what we need to do. So that's my encouragement to everybody who is wow. who struggling about whether or not we should be involved in politics because they don't want to be partisan. Listen, my ability to live and to breathe is not partisan. That is a human right that God wants me to be able to have. So I don't want people talking about that it's left wing or right wing. Left wing people want to breathe. White, right wing people want to breathe. Yeah, we yeah, all yeah. want to breathe and that is not political. Come on. So just That's good, letting Doc. people know that. And right. just one last thing, I started off saying to everyone, you know, it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to feel um, rage. It's okay for your body to be worn out. But I also want us to know that it's okay to be okay too. Because mm -hmm. sometimes we might feel so enraged about everything. And we feel like we have to do something like there's, there's a desire to do something. And it can overwhelm us, just like the James Baldwin quote that was that was talked about earlier, to be woke and conscious in America as a black person is to be in a constant state of rage. That idea that, we're, that we have that rage about injustice, that is something that is natural, but also it's okay to allow yourself to be okay. It's okay to allow yourself to feel free because that's also what we're fighting for. That's also what we're trying to achieve. Your right 
and my right to live in happiness and in well-being and not to feel constantly oppressed. So allowing ourselves, it's mentally healthy for us to allow ourselves to relax sometimes. I'm not saying be lackadaisical. I'm not saying be just a slacktivist or just a keyboard warrior because we got to do all the things that were said here today, all of the things that we need to do to be involved in the system, to change the system because we are the system. We got to do all that, but it's also okay to smile, not feel guilty about that, not feeling bad about not being enraged all the time because that is an unsustainable place for us emotionally wow. and it tears us down emotionally. So I want, I, I don't know if, if you care about me giving you permission, but for somebody out there, I'm giving you permission <laughs> to yeah. breathe and to be okay, to laugh and to smile and to be all right and not be, not be 24 seven mm -hmm. in a place where you are um, under distress and under stress. It's okay for you to be okay sometimes as well. Pastor Josiah, I can do this yeah, in thanks. two seconds, I promise. Go ahead. Uh, but I really want to um, drive home something that Judge Harrell said as well. I really need the saints to understand some practical things that you can do um, to get involved out of this, because I really do agree that the system is, and the power is in our hands. There are things like um, community boards, town halls, things that you can attend in your community uh -huh. to hold your leaders accountable. Depending on the county, there are things called citizen review boards that you can attend that the literal purpose is for citizens to have a voice and the opportunity to hold officers accountable when they in, do misconduct. Um, but not every county has a citizen review board. So, hey, if you're in a county and you found out you don't have a citizen review board, that's something that you can talk with your leadership and your local officials about instituting. There are other counties that have things like uh, a policing advisory commission or committee. You can sit on that and the mere purpose of that committee is to actually talk through new policies, building relationship between community and policing. So I, I really want to encourage you guys um, to take some initiative and to, to do some research um, on the websites of your local um, you know, county officials and figure out what are the areas that I can get involved in? Where are the places that I can volunteer? Where can I make my voice heard? How can I be of service? So that just like the judge was saying, we don't have to just stay in our houses complaining about outcomes when we actually have avenues where we can actively make change. Wow, receive that. We received that. And Claudia, uh, I got a lot of people texting me. I'm trying to multitask. They want to know about your blog. Where they, where can they find your... I saw you were trying to help out in the chat. Session. I was trying my best. Yeah, I know. T can tell blog everyone... Is yeah, the blog is on Medium. So if you go to Medium or if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, if you go to my Instagram page at C-A-M-A-A-L, Kamal 365, um, you know, you can click on my profile and, and the link will be there, but it's on Medium. So go to Medium, look for Claudia Allen and uh, you can find it there. And you've got my cell. So if you can text that to me, and I'm gonna send that out to all the other folk that's been <laughs> that's been texting me while I've been sitting here. Do that. Uh, uh, man, look, man, I want to thank all of you. And again, I know that most of your panels that you've been on uh, have been, you know, four or five people, and we had about 10, 11, 12. Uh, I know our past, some of our pastors had to drop off and leave, uh, but I think that sometimes we need everybody at the dinner table because there are people out here who are in all aspects of life uh, who need all of your expertise from, from our mental health and uh, our fatigue. I found myself, you know, having to take deep breaths. And, and I thought it was because I was scared of COVID-19 when I was out there in Kansas City protesting the last couple of weeks and my, my wife didn't let me go take a test. She's like, no, nah, ain't nothing wrong with you, bro. You know, you're good. And I'm panicking because I'm, you know, I'm waking up early and, you know, uh, but, but the mental anguish uh, is real, man. If you if you're black in America and you don't feel that, man, something might be wrong with you. 
Um, but I want to thank the professors, Dr. Golden, Dr. Courtney, Dr. Ty. Ty, I see that you're you're unmuted. Did you want to say something? I, I just want to just say one thank you. But two, I, as I'm looking at the chat as well, um, I uh -huh. think that there are people who want to know what like where do they go from here as it relates to resources yes. in the life. So I was just wondering, Pastor Josiah, is there a space for people who are watching who want to be a part of, of okay, how, I, what do I do? How do I engage? What should I read? Um, mm. I, I just wonder about that because I think it's important also to have an asset-based, uh, yes. the assumption, hope that uh, uh, people of various backgrounds, including our white brothers and sisters who are watching as well, want to be a part of the yeah. of, of solution. So if there's a, a way that we can uh, do that, and I would just like to recommend a film uh, it's called Race the Power of an Illusion, The House We Live In. It's actually a three-part series. Um, but Say the third again? series called Race the Power of an Illusion. Um, and then the third and the third part of the series is called The House We Live In. And it literally breaks down, for example, the housing market in this country and how what you see in the neighborhoods is connected to policies racist policies that were implemented by the government like redlining uh, and and so it will help people to begin to understand systematic oppression because i believe uh, as as uh, uh, claudia allen uh, i think rightly highlighted you know we've also internalized our, mm -hmm. our, our racism mm -hmm. so i believe you think about the, the the majority of folks who are watching there are going to be some things that we have to unlearn i would like to suggest there's a parent that may need to ask their child about their experience being at a Adventist school, but maybe maybe it's a predominantly white Adventist school, and there may be some questions they need to have around those conversations. Maybe they had a good experience. I'm not saying they, mm -hmm. it was a bad one, but mm -hmm. going from here is is some truth telling, but also some space to learn and to ask. And so, if there's a space, passages I have for those yes. who have set through our conference uh, to to continue the conversation, not just in yeah. panel form, but in right. learning from Courtney and. Dr. Good and others and, and the, the judges and everybody, right? How can yes. uh, connect with those individuals? Yeah, well, well, here's a good thing. So I'm the panel director for the conference. And, uh, and, and what I can do is I can talk to our IT guy, Jonathan. And I have, I have, two, I have two pages of notes that, I, that I've been taking. Uh, so, so my other job is the secretary. It, you know, part of what I do is take <laughs> minutes for all of our committees you know, and so I've got two pages of 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 your counsel, uh, and what I would do is I don't, I'm not a blog person. Uh, somebody told me maybe I should start writing blogs. I like to write, uh, but 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 I'm gonna put it in some kind of form, Dr. Ty, where our people can access it. Maybe it'll be on our website. Uh, I'll talk to Jonathan, uh, and then uh, whatever materials that you all have. Uh, so I have the I have the movie. I have some of the things. Um, that, that I'm taking notes of, uh, and then I can share it. Go ahead, Dr. Ty. One, one last request, and this is on behalf of those who are not in spaces who can say this or ask this. I mm. think I would like to ask on behalf of the people that there are conversations that happen across state conference leadership, Pastor Josiah. Uh, yes, yes. To, to, to demand that they are involved in these conversations because we have black bodies, black mm -hmm. leaders, black children in those spaces, and they may not be able to say it. And so I'm, I'm asking on behalf of the meeting, the constituency, that the man that cross conversations happen. I know there are great relationships that already exist, but I know that right. there is inertia, and discomfort in having these conversations. I believe we have well meaning and also leaders in those spaces who want to be a part, but I believe it's going to require leaders like yourself, uh, out of Bernard and others, to say, we have to. Um, now is the time. So I just want to ask that respectfully on behalf of our, 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 our constituents. Got it. Got it. Got it, man. All right. Well, look, y'all, we, we, it's, it's 630 on the dot. That's 730 on the East Coast for, for Claudia and Courtney. Um, and, and I appreciate y'all coming on. Uh, I know our, we, we've got folk that had questions, I guess, in the chat. Uh, but, man, there's no way we could have covered it all today. But, but I, will, I will make it uh, my business to, to, uh, to document what we've talked about here. And, and you guys have uh, my email. Uh, and so if there's information that you think I should have that I can share, uh, Claudia, you had some, some, some things there that I, that I took note, note of, dismantling racism, structural, institutional, internal, interpersonal. You know, I'm taking notes, man, I'm taking notes. But, but if there's anything else that can help our people, uh, you guys, uh, Tim, you got my number. Um, Kevin, you got my, you know, whatever we can do, because what we don't want to do, as has been said already, is to fall off. Or, or, or 
get complacent because we've been down this road before. Um, and, and we're just going to pray that everybody commits. I'm going to close with this. Um, and then we're going to jump off uh, and say goodbye to our listening and our viewing audience. Here's what Jesus said his mission was. Uh, this is for the folk who are not sure uh, why we should be engaged or why we are so engaged. Uh, Luke 4, 18, the Bible says, Jesus said, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's our job, uh, to be like Christ. Uh, and we're praying that everyone that's been listening, uh, you can't do everything. Uh, and a lot of information has been shared, but you can do something. Uh, you've heard from our officers, you've heard from our judge, you've heard from our activists, you've heard from our professors, um, you've heard from our pastors. We can make a difference because when Jesus comes, he's not going to ask about the system. He's going to ask about you. What did you do? Matthew 25, going back to Dr. Doggett, what did you do for the least of these? Let's pray ourselves out of here. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to ask God to bless this and, uh, uh, and, and that he would motivate uh, those who were listening. Father God, we thank you for this conversation. We thank you for this discussion. We thank you for the nuggets of truth and righteousness and justice that was, that was dropped in to this little space right here. And Lord, I pray that the words that we have heard would not fall on deaf ears. Lord, I pray that the notes that have been taken, Lord, we will be able to put them into action. Lord, I pray for every panelist uh, on this line. I pray that you will bless them, bless their families, watch over them as they do this important work uh, of making a difference where they are. Lord, we pray a special prayer for our officers, uh, uh, Officer O'Kelly, Lord, who's been in this thing a long time, and, and Officer Hunt, Lord, who's on the beat, on the streets. Uh, even right now, Lord, I pray that you would watch over these these brothers, Lord, keep them safe, Lord. We we can hear the tension, we can feel it uh, as black men in America, but still being in uniform uh, and having to, to to straddle that proverbial fence, Lord. I pray that they will uh, make those changes where they are, as, as Rurik said, Lord. Just make a difference, as my mentor, Elder Polite, would always say. Let's just brighten the corner where we are, uh, and Lord, when we do this thing, we're not doing it for man. We're not even doing it. Uh, for the country. We're doing it, Lord, because we see you. We're doing it for the least of these. And Lord, we just want to hear those words when you return. Well done, uh, because we were faithful in the little things. Jury duty. We were faithful in the little things. Now you will make us rulers over many. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Thank you again, God, uh, for your spirit and for being here with us tonight. We ask these mercies as we leave this place that we will never leave your presence. In Jesus' name, let all God's children say amen. And amen again. Amen again. Thank you so much, y'all, for joining. Uh, and for those of you who want to be a part of the Miles to Minneapolis, you see there it started in Washington, D.C. on June the 14th. And it's going to end tomorrow in Minneapolis, in Central States Conference Territory, uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 uh, Central Time, so six-hour time here in the Midwest. Uh, Please join us uh, in this interfaith prayer journey uh, that started in Maryland last Sunday, went to Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Columbus, Detroit, Chicago, and will end here in the Central States Conference Territory tomorrow night. Be a part of it. Y'all, thank you for coming out. God bless you real good. And we will see you all next time here at the Central States Conference. God bless you.